Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined back by our old friend, Kurt Ekstrom. Kurt, welcome back on the podcast. Hello. Thanks for having me once again. Yes. Number three, I think, for you. You're, yeah. you're a return, you're a repeat offender, because uh, I, yeah. I can trust you, and you always have very good information. And um, today is no uh, exception, because we are talking about Alex Van Halen, who has maybe some of the most famous, iconic, huge, unique drum sets in the world. And and I'm, I'm you've been working on this for a while, so I appreciate you taking the time and putting all this great information together for everyone. Well, I appreciate, again, you having me on here. It's always great to be on this show because there's so many great episodes. And, um, and I just really just got to say, like, if Alex, if you ever watch this or anything, I mean, Alex has probably been my greatest inspiration. I know I did an episode on John Densmore, and you probably couldn't find a more polar opposite. But... <laughs> But when I was, you know, 12 years old, I discovered, you know, playing drums in Van Halen and, and it just, you know, it was just infectious. And it was one of those things that I just, Alex has been my greatest inspiration over the years and he's done so much. I wouldn't be half the drummer I was, am today if it wasn't for that influence. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. There's something I mean, yes. So Kurt said it. He was on, uh, he did a John Densmore gear episode. You also did a uh, WFL drum uh, history episode, which is more pure, like the brand WFL drums. So I'll put those in the description, but um, something about Alex Van Halen is just so cool. It's funny because I, you know, here I am mostly playing a four piece kit 90% of the time. And, and, but when you look at, you know, as a 12 year old and you look at this guy behind this rocket ship of a drum set with a pair of sunglasses on and, you know, and the guys are just like having the time of their lives. It's like, okay, like, where do I sign up? You know, like, of course, you know, like <laughs> they are having fun. That's for sure. Maybe a little too much fun at times. Cause, uh, those, they, they kind of defined a, a generation of, of, uh, partying. You look at it's like the eighties is Van Halen and, and partying. Um, and that's the yeah. thing too. Like, obviously I won't get into really any of the, you know, the, the, the hard stuff or anything like that, but, but those guys literally were able to, as much as partying as they did, they were able to also like put off a great show. Like rarely yeah. ever did they he let the party and get in the way of a great show. No, so. Alex and Eddie are like above all else, world-class phenomenal musicians eddie yep. unfortunately passed away uh, i guess a couple years ago at this point 20, 2020 yeah 2020 yeah okay well, that makes yeah but um anyway so we're gonna dig into all the gear today and i'm super excited yes. but very fast before we do this i want to give a patreon shout out we got a new upper tier member um, which they get a shout out on the episode and you can too if you go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast and you can sign up there but uh real quick thank you to mr seth mcconnell for signing up um he said mcconnell drum co he he runs a small drum company that builds vintage style custom drums for youth groups and churches and uh it's mcconnell drum co you can find him on instagram as well mcconnell drum co um and check him out there so thank you to seth mcconnell for doing that really helps support the show um So, Kurt, let's jump in here. We got a lot to cover. This is going to probably, this is definitely going to be a multi-part episode. We have lots of photos if you were watching on YouTube, um, and it's going to be awesome. Otherwise, you can just listen, and we'll do our best to explain everything if you're a normal podcast listener. So, um, here we go. Let's jump in, and um, Kurt, take it away with, you know, the the beginning of Alex's drumming career. So, um Just to get a little brief, brief, you know, history of where Alex and Eddie came from. They were born in Holland and, and been basically music had been in their family because their father was a, you know, clarinet player and a, and a jazz sax player and, and, um, met their mother who was from Indonesia. So Alex and Eddie are Dutch and Indonesian. And long story short, they had family members that were living in the U S specifically California and, in 1962, they moved to California with basically like 50 bucks and a piano. And so they came to America and they were, they early on took piano lessons. And so Alex uh, excelled in like violin and piano and he actually was able to read really well. And it's also, I've heard that he has perfect pitch, whereas in like Eddie was more of a, a, a play by ear and all that. And so they were winning piano competitions, but, um, They got sick of the piano scene, and so at some point, Eddie wanted to play drums, and so 
uh, he got himself a paper route and he went and, and it's a famous story. He went and bought himself this $125 St. George drum set. Just to explain you, just so people think they heard that correctly. Eddie bought the drum set first because he was the yeah. drummer in the family first. Yes. So this is, you know, when Eddie and Alex were kids, you know, back in Holland, you can see they already had, you know, something, something going on musical. And, and they also actually had a band when they were kids called the Broken Combs, where Eddie played piano and Alex played saxophone. And so, um, and they had a couple of friends, which ironically played the guitar and drums. But when we get to this drum set, the $125 Japanese drum set, Eddie is the one who bought this thing with his paper root money. And so uh, Alex at the time got flamenco guitar lessons. And because I guess their mother wanted them to do something respectable. And so while, uh, while Eddie was out throwing the papers, as he recalls, Alex took to his drum set and ended up being able to play Wipeout a lot faster than Eddie could. And so mm. basically Eddie got frustrated and irritated that Alex could you know play the drums better than he could. So he said, fine, I'll take your guitar. And that's the famous swap story, and and, wow. and 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 of course, as Eddie tells the story over the years, he makes the gripe saying, "Well, Alex was better than me, so I took his guitar." But if you listen to Alex tell the story, he says, "Well, the minute Edward picked up my guitar, he goes, you know, you any fool could see that he had a natural a gift for it." And Alex said, "You know, I could play the chords, I could read the music, but it just was a piece of wood with strings." And when Edward picked it up, he was making music with it, and it was. Instant and so I guess technically they're both right, but yeah, but that's so great anyway, though. They're yeah, good brotherly love there. But that drum set he's playing on there, what was the brand you said? Saint George. Um, Saint George. I guess it's probably um one of the many millions of knockoff Japanese names. Yeah, and, and Hoshino so, or one of those kind yeah. of parent companies. Yeah, yeah, and it looks to be like in a sky blue pearl type of finish. Uh, yep. It's really hard to tell from the photo, of course. And then it also looks like it's pr likely like a 20, a 12, and a 14. But mm -hmm. um, but there really is not a whole lot known of this period between when Alex actually started to play the drums to when Eddie, you know, they switched. And so the next time you really like hear her much, there's a, there's a great book called Van Halen Rising that was written by Greg Rainoff, and he details a lot of the early years of the, the Van Halens. And apparently... Their father was the guy that was the one who was um, the fun. You know, he was the one that played in bands. You know, he had a regular day job, but he also played in bands to get by. And and all, you know, all of them lived in a, a small, small house. And so um, Alex's mother was the one that would, you know, the, he was, she was the one that would crack the whip. But apparently their father, seeing a budding interest in their son's, you know, musical stuff was always very encouraging to them. Like, here's a picture of... Eddie and uh, you can see Eddie in the middle, sadly, you know, holding a cigarette, but you yeah, can see, um, yeah. you know, how young they are. And Alex has one too. And they're with their friends. And this is like 1967. You can actually see the Beatles picture in the background where it's oh, like, yeah. the, you know, the, from like, uh, you know, magical mystery tour or something. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the guy I believe that is on the far right with the guitar is a friend of theirs that actually played bass. And so, Eddie and Alex would play in a trio with this guy playing bass. And then sometimes they would switch off and this guy would play guitar and Eddie would pick up the bass. But these were just a bunch of their friends hanging around. But in August of 1969, which ironically was pretty much like Woodstock weekend, there actually has been floating around online this bill of sale from a music store that's in um, California. It's like music for everyone, I guess. And mm -hmm. it was in Pasadena where the Van Halens lived. And you can see that Jan Van Halen, their father, traded in some musical instruments to, um, and they got Eddie his first uh, Gibson guitar. He got like a Gibson gold top. But when you look, you see under the drum set, it says Cooper Pro drum set. And it was like $200. I kind of looked you know, just to see what, what was what as far as $200 in 1969. And I mean, if I were to guess, I would say that drums, that might be the equivalent of like a Gretsch Catalina, like a, you know, like a, a midline Gretsch, not the lowest yeah. line, but I, yeah. um, but, uh, but a Cooper pro was like, apparently I, I discovered this online too, with help from some people on drum form that, um, Cooper was a, a store owner and basically he would import these brand names in from like Pearl who would make all these millions of names, probably like the St. George. And, and so yeah. he was putting his own name on stuff. Cooper. I've heard that 
a lot of times before that a lot yeah. of times people will find them and they'll say, what brand is this? And it's like, it's probably the shop owner. If yeah, you've never it, heard of it, if right. it's not Star, it's probably, you know, the the Ekstrom brand drums or something. But but sadly, this this receipt, as cool as it is, and it's, I mean, a, a unbelievably rare to find it, it doesn't list, you know, nobody bothered to write anything about the drums as far as like, I don't know if it came with symbols. I don't know what hardware it came with. I don't know how many pieces the set was. Um, I'm going to assume it was likely maybe some kind of a four piece if it was only like two hundred dollars, but um, but the interesting sure. thing that I note in this the next picture I'll show is there is a picture of Eddie and Alex and I'm assuming that previous guy that's playing bass I think it's him and if you look at this picture it's the only picture I've ever seen like this but it looks like Alex is playing like like a sky blue, blue pearl type of drum set but clearly it's double bass and so it makes me wonder if this Cooper Bro drum set was actually in like a sky blue pearl color and he just like basically added the pieces to that old you know uh, St. George and made a double bass kit out of it we've all done that in our life you're every everyone who's owned two drum sets has gone wait a minute yeah I can create a double bass set yeah which looks cool. Well, and the other thing to note, there's several things that are really kind of cool to note. Uh, and one of them you can thank Edward for, but uh, Edward was, as many know, was a constant tinkerer. And, and and Alex, too, to a degree. It's really kind of interesting to think that Jan Van Halen paid, you know, like $600 or whatever it was for that guitar. But Eddie you know, was never happy. And so he was constantly like taking the pickups up or changing something around. So, you know, think about it in today's world. Like, you know, you buy a brand new Gibson. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to take it home and rip the pickups off and like, no, I no, you're going to like, too. exactly. So it's really interesting to note that Eddie and, and even Alex really just were like, if something did not work the way they wanted it to work, then they would like, okay, we're changing it. And it really didn't matter what it cost or whatever. The end result was was worth the means, you know. And and clearly it worked yeah. out for Edward because he, you know, created a style and a sound, and which is a whole other story. I just want to throw in that, like, it's very common for, like, famous drummers to not be gear nuts and fanatics. Because just because you're incredibly talented doesn't mean you want to go home and rip apart your guitar or your drums and know everything about them and memorize every piece of gear. And that's honestly a lot of times why I talk to people like you instead of maybe the drummer themselves, not that I'm have access to Alex Van Halen, but you know what I mean? I, I know exactly S what you mean. Sometimes the expert like you knows way more, but it sounds like in, in these guys case, they are absolute gear gearheads. Well, it, it, it is, but it, it just blows my mind that like, as we'll see as we move on to the next kit, it just blows my mind that, that if, if, you know, Alex or Eddie didn't like something about whatever gear they were using, it didn't matter if it was a, you know, it could have been, you know, a Gretsch white Falcon that Eddie was playing. And if he didn't like the sound of it, he was going to do whatever it took to make it sound right. It didn't yeah. matter if the guitar was worth $100,000 or it was worth, you know, they, they just, you know, they're tools. They got a sound in their head and they want to get it. And then, you know, yeah. by, you know they're going to get it. And so yeah. the last cool thing to note in this photo, and it's a consistent you will see in every picture with Alex, is that he just, he was a, he was a big guy. He was tall and he liked the hi-hats as high as they would go. And so mm. if you look at this picture, which is like a very, very early picture of him jamming with Eddie with that Les Paul. So it has to be probably, I'm guessing, between 1969 and early 1970. But you can see the hi-hat is all the way up as far as it would go. Yeah. And Alex also sat very low, almost like he had the stool go as low as it possibly could go. So, like, if I were whoever have sat on one of his kits, I'd have been screwed because the hi-hats would have been, you know, way up here, <laughs> and I'd be sitting on the floor, and I'd be like, wow. But he yeah. he must have had a very tall torso because a lot yeah, of times really. in videos and stuff, you'll see how he can just sort of flip his wrist and hit a symbol that looks like it's like 20 feet away from, you know, or, or yeah. where he's sitting and stuff. This episode is brought to you by Yana Tech. Yana Tech is happy to offer all natural products to help keep you at the top of your creativity. Yana Tech's formulas were created for musicians by Nicholas McGrone, who has worked in the natural product industry for over 20 years and is also a working musician and teacher of all things drum related. He understands the wellness demands that being a musician requires. Empower yourself and your creativity with Yana Tech's flagship product, Magnamind. Magnamind is an all-natural, nootropic formulation designed to support cognition, memory, and mood. This helps keep you sharp on the road, in the studio, or in the rehearsal space. 
keep those pesky germs at bay with their immune supporting formula Defense 4. With vitamin C, vitamin D3, zinc, and quercetin, this can support your wellness while traveling, working long days and nights in the studio, or just encountering the demands of daily life. They also offer wild mountain oregano oil in capsules to help protect you during the cold and flu season. Throw a bottle in your carry-on to help shield you when the weather gets too cold for comfort. Use code DRUMHISTORY15 for 15% off your order. Find Yana Tech online at yanatech.store. That's Y-A-N-A tech dot store. And also, readers of the popular magazine Downbeat can also find Yana Tech in the current issue and in the upcoming winter issue featured at the 2024 Winter NAM Show. Thanks to Yana Tech for sponsoring this episode. So 19, he was born in 1953. Right, if this yes. is 1969, he would have been 16. So it's a pretty tall and lanky time for a lot of people who are like, yeah. have his body style of like, you know, his limbs are all like, you, I don't want to say gangly, but there's yeah. a lot of 16 year olds who are, you know, have very long torsos and limbs and haven't grown into yeah. it yet. So, so the other thing to note is it in is he got this Cooper Pro drum set in likely August of sixty nine, and clearly, you know, probably no fault of his, you know, his father. I mean, I'm sure he was more than grateful to get this set, but it just wasn't a professional drum set. You know, he was, you know, he and Edward were on on a path to playing, you know, the real deal. Edward was sure. yet to get his famous Marshall, and you know, and and he's made a comment about how you know. Kids didn't play these things, you know, only God, like Eric Clapton played them and stuff. And so, so yeah. Alex, of course, was a big John Bonham, uh, Ginger Baker, uh, all, the, you know, he loved all those guys. And, and so, of course, he's had his sights on a Ludwig kit. And so this is the part I'd be really curious to ask him about at some point. But, and, and this kit, when I talk about this kit, uh, I know Alex isn't an over overly sentimental guy when it comes to his drums. He's given a lot of them okay. away and stuff. But this particular drum set, in my opinion, is one of the most like just important drum sets in the entire Van Halen history because mm. he got this kit likely in 1970. That's a Ludwig Pro Beat. And so it's a 24 with a 9x13, 10x14, 16x16, and a 16x18. And but somehow, and I don't know how this all worked out, he added another 14 by 26 to make it a double base kit, which became a pretty much a consistent, as you'll see going forwards in his size choice sizes. He always seemed to prefer having like two different size bass drums. Yeah. I don't know exactly why. Maybe it was because of Ginger Baker, because Ginger Baker had 20 and a 22, and maybe that's where it stems from. But um sure. But Alex got this kit which was a silver sparkle like like Ginger Baker. And I would guess, if I, if I were to guess, you know, a brand new Ludwig set from 1970 in, in those sizes, I mean, it must have cost a fortune, absolute yeah. fortune. And it was clear yeah. from listening to those guys talk about their childhood that they were broke. They didn't have any money. But there is a story where Alex was working in a machine shop for a while, and he ended up quitting because he nearly took off a finger when he was mm. working in the machine shop, I guess he cut it really bad. And I don't know exactly when this was, but, but if I were to guess, I would say maybe he worked, you know, worked his butt off enough to earn enough money to like, you know, afford this Ludwig kit there. There's yeah. just, there's yeah. no, there's no receipt for it. It's never been talked about where it came from or any of that. But when being a Ludwig historian, you know, when you look at the kit that when, let me see. When you you know when you move on when I move on down the road to like other pictures of the kit, it's got clear maple interiors. It's got blue olive badges, which first appeared in late late nineteen sixty nine. You know, so it, the kit is likely in nineteen seventy. I'm guessing, and I yeah, would likely sure. guess that he probably acquired the kit sometime like maybe a year after after like that he got the Cooper Pro drum set. So seventy ish. So, so it's got. I'm, I'm guessing it's at least a 1971. And the, okay. the set, as you saw in the catalog picture, it came with a five and a half by fourteen chrome superphonic, which is basically like they made Ludwig made billions of them. And so mm -hmm. that's what the kit originally came with. Now we we're talking about Alex's size and all that. There's a couple of pictures from like high school. You can see him at like his prom or something, and you know he's kind of <laughs> as you say. Gangly tall and tall guy. Yeah. And then here's his um high school graduation picture you can see. 
But now this next picture I'm going to show, I feel like it's one of the coolest pictures I've ever seen. So this picture here is Alex and Edward, and you can tell that it's from about 1970 or so. And it must be like right around the time he got this Ludwig kit, because normally you'd say, well, you know, how do you know it's not the Cooper Pro drum set? Because you can't really see much. But if you look, there's definitely two floor toms. I mean, if you were to really look at the bottom of this picture, there are definitely like two floor toms there. There are definitely like... um. Edward's playing the Les Paul. You could yeah. actually probably, and I'm not I'm a guitar expert, but he's probably already modified that thing in some way or another with the pickups. But the coolest thing to note also is the fact that they are literally set up in the, the living room of the Van Halen household. Like, <laughs> here these guys are with Alex with his main, giant double bass kit, which as again would be a 26, a 24, you know, 13, 14, 16, 18. And, and I think he may have been playing Zildjian cymbals. I mean, that's the thing. People have called me out on the Densmore episode. I'm just not really great at looking at cymbal profiles and guessing because there's some great shots of these cymbals. But, um, but Peisty cymbals were, you know, granted they were distributed by Ludwig. They were still not the easiest things to get. And they were, they were likely expensive. And, mm -hmm. and I have heard that Alex likely started off with Zildjian cymbals, but he, of course, later on gravitated to Peisty and has played them ever since. On that photo, is that one of those like double stack um, cymbal stands where it, like it looks it. The, the crash in front of him is coming off of the through the bell of the I guess that would be. Yeah another crowd or a ride maybe in that yeah it, kinda... it, it does look it i i wish that photo had been panned down just even an inch you know like yeah. i would have been able to see a little bit more but i yeah. would bet just about anything that that's that's probably the earliest picture of that ludwig kit uh that would be my likely guess just well, given... i mean really putting yourself in that moment of like it could have been like i just got this incredible drum set Let's kind of have fun and celebrate and set this thing up in the living room. And mom was like, okay with it because it's brand new. Probably a week later or a day later, she's like, get this out of my living room. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've read a lot about those guys, and I really heard that the parents let them basically do whatever they wanted in that, you know, when it came to practicing. That's good. You know, it's good, the, good the, good thing. The neighborhood kids would come over and their mothers would mother would make, you know, every kid a sandwich and, oh, that's you know, stuff yeah. like that. And so yeah. – Anyway, uh, cool. when we move on, uh, because somewhere in those years, they uh, they were playing as a trio called Mammoth for a while, which is where you know Wolfgang, you know, was borrowing the name from the old, you know, Van Halen was called for. I guess they were called Genesis for a while, and they changed the name to Van uh, Mammoth, and then after Mammoth, they changed the name to Van Halen. Actually, on the suggestion of David Lee Roth, who eventually made his way into the band in 1973. And so and that's a whole story that's, you know, for whatever. But um, yeah. but when David joined the band, they actually had a keyboard player and they had um, a bass player named Mark Stone. And so there was, you know, uh, so there's this great picture that uh, a friend of theirs took when they played some gig outdoors. Now you can, uh, another couple of cool things you can see in this photo, there's clearly, there's the Ludwig kit. But the one thing that's kind of weird about it is um, he's using some... Um, like he's still somewhere. I'm sure he just didn't bring it with him, but he's got, you know, the 13 and the 14 toms. But in this picture, he's actually playing a no name stencil silver sparkle tom that was drilled out with a Ludwig mount on it. And so it's like his toms at this picture are probably 12, 13 with a 16 and an 18. Um, but you can see in this photo him basically sitting on the ground, his stool's as low as it goes. Yeah. Uh, you can also see that he's got the hi hats all the way up again. And the other thing to note, and something you'll notice in all the future things, is when they when it came to monitors back in those days, uh, Alex was just needed to hear Eddie, and so they would literally have a cabinet next to Alex that was just Eddie. And so in these early photos, you could see that he's got like an amp on the ground that is likely just Eddie blaring at him because he needed wow. to hear Eddie. Looks like there's a wah pedal just kind of on the ground next to him. Oh, uh, you know, he's got a, a, a beer next to his right foot. Yeah, there's a beer. <laughs> and uh, he's on this crap, crappy old blanket. And you yeah, can see a, the. Not a, not a rug, but a blanket. Yeah. And you could see like the, you know, the stringy guitar cord hanging down is, you know, Eddie's guitar cord. And, uh, but the other thing to note, which, you know, the guy's not standing there, but you can see the Wurlitzer keyboard was set up in the background. Yes. And that's yes. where they had a keyboard player. And I guess, you know, Eddie always hated it because he always liked to, uh, improvise when you had another corded instrument like that 
you know, you kind of had to stick to the changes because the guy yeah, was yeah. playing the chords. And so anyway, so there's that early photo. But one of the things you'll note in this photo is the bass drum interiors are still clear. Um, cause that's how they came from the factory. They stopped using the white paint around, um, the early part of 68 and they went to a clear maple interior. So as you move along, they did some, uh, early, early demo sessions and here's a shot. And now you can clearly see that little eight by 12 Tom. It's, it's not a Ludwig clearly. When I first saw the picture, I thought it might've been a Gretsch, but it's actually, I think a no name brand, um, drum. You can still see the clear maple interiors in the set. And it's, and it's, you know, funny to see he's got no bottom head on the floor, Tom, and then his hi-hats again all the way up, but they're in this recording studio, which I believe was called Charity Studios, and they made like a really, really early demo of some songs and stuff. And so, obviously, you know, he didn't bring the whole kit in there, you know, because he probably didn't need it. Uh, and here's another shot, from, you know, you see, again, hi-hats all the way up, playing the 5x14 Superphonic, uh, sitting on the floor. You know, the typical, you know, that kind of thing. It looks like he's using Ludwig Atlas hardware, all probably with stuff that came with the set. So when you move on, this photo here, the next one, it looks like, um, I believe this is when Michael Anthony joined the band. I think that's Michael Anthony all the way over on his left. But what you'll see that's kind of interesting is now Alex has that, you know, no-name Japanese Tom on the far you know, his far left as far as sitting at the kit, but then he has the 13 and then he has the 14. So he's using three racks. And so you can see, you know, he must've been fooling around with that kind of thing. And you can see that the toms have to be the 13 and the 14 because they're mounted off the bass drum and the blue olive badges are facing audience side, which is the way the set was intended to be set up. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And then the other thing that looks weird is I can't tell, but there's the person at the bottom. I can't tell what they're doing, but I'm wondering if they have a camera. And I wonder it if it looks they, like a camera or placing a mic or something, but it could be it, definitely be a camera. So maybe that's out there somewhere. And, and it's it's bizarre too because Edward doesn't have his guitar and Michael's not playing a bass and Alex is playing and you don't see any symbols in this picture. Like I don't know what they were doing, but it's promo um, shots or something. Yeah, never... it's it's hard to know. Maybe you you could be right. Um, yeah. So anyway, as you know, we progress. You know, as the club goes, club days go on. You can see Alex. You know, playing the Edward's still playing this Les Paul. Um, you know, they were into sort of the, the flannel, the, I guess you call it the grunge look later, but, yeah. but they, he, he's, flannel. he's got no, um, looks like, you know, he may have the front head on the right bass drum, but not one on the left bass drum, uh, and no heads on the floor toms, you know, um, but the interesting thing to note is when you look at this picture and you'll see in later pictures, the interiors of the bass drums are now white. Oh yeah. So they, so he painted them. So he painted them and you might, you know, and, and if you didn't really see the earlier pictures with the maple, you might think, well, Ludwig painted white interiors. But as you'll see, as I move along here to these other photos, they're clearly white inside the base rooms now. But the funny thing to note is like, I don't think he took the hardware off because you can actually see he painted right over the screws and everything. But that goes to my earlier point of the fact that like, I'm wondering if Alex, like, like he talks later on about like how, you know, he wanted his drums to sound like John Bonham. And he was frustrated that the fact that, you know, they went into the studio and had to take the bottom heads off. Well, I'm guessing in the club days, they probably just didn't have microphones and he was looking for added projection and volume because Eddie was playing a Marshall at one point and before he figured out, and this is a whole other thing you could find anywhere else, but he, in a nutshell, basically just figured out this very act thing that he would put in his amp and would let him lower the voltage so he could keep the volume, you know, the amp sounding the same. But prior yeah. to that, he had to turn the amp up on 10 or let's, you know, I guess every guitar player tells you that, but you know, you yeah. turn the guitar on 10 to get the tone. And so Alex not having, you know, a real set of probably good microphones had to compete with that. So I'm wondering if he thought, you know what, maybe if I paint the shells white and take the bottom heads off, they'll project more, but it, yeah, it, sure. it, it goes to the saying earlier, as I was saying that like, this was, you know, say 1974, these pictures. So this was a drum set that had to have been what, three years old. Yeah, that would be my pro that'd be my baby that I would never touch. I'd probably be not even want to change the front bass drum head or, you know, and they're just like, yeah, just and you know what? This. I'm going to take it out into the garage. And it also, it makes me wonder because it wouldn't surprise me because when people were poor and things like, I actually wonder if that's the same white can of spray paint that Eddie used to paint his original Frankenstrat. Like yeah, it wouldn't maybe. surprise me probably. one bit if the white paint inside those bass rooms was the same spray paint can that was used, you know, 
that just in the garage. It was yeah. just in the garage. And so, um, yeah. but it is funny to note in these photos, he, like he, literally he painted right over the hardware. And, uh, but you can also <laughs> see the little Tom again, you can see that small eight by 12 and it's clearly like a no name. You can actually tell the wood grains are going up and down. So, and so, and you can tell that Alex is playing the 13 inch Tom on the other side because the badge is facing the audience. And it looks like there's like egg carton kind of material yeah. or like the, like the, the kind of egg foam, whatever you call it yeah. um, on the inside of the bass drum. But it's also kind of neat to notice that, you know, ingenuity serves best that he used like basically like a, a cymbal arm that you would use like basically on a, like a cymbal mounted off the bass drum kind of a, you know, like in the sixties kits where he would have the cymbal off the bass drum. It looks yeah. like he used one of those and mounted it straight on the Tom holder to put his you know left side crash up there. Because yeah. as you well know, when you're trying to put a crash in on a double bass kit, it, unless you have a boom stand, it can be a real pain in the butt. Quite the different logo, Van Halen. You know, and, and that it's, was it's, the early, early logo they had for Van Halen. I believe it was yeah. designed by their original bass player, Mark Stone, which ironically is, you know, Mark Stone passed away, I want to say like a month before Edward. You know, like they were, it was the same oh, year, wow. everything. It was very strange, but... So I know I'm like spending some time on this kit, but we're, oh, it, 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 it's a very evolutionary kit. And this is why I find it very fascinating. So as we move along to the next one, you will see now, like, you know, look, you can see all the Toms got painted white inside. He put front heads on there. But the other thing to note is that and this had to have been around 1975. He acquired his first super sensitive. So prior to that, he was mm -hmm. playing this five by 14 superphonic that likely came with the set. Well, he got his first super sensitive, I'm guessing around 1975. And so um, he really, for some reason, I guess he really liked the super sensitive six and a half by 14. And uh, and also to note that's off to his far left is a Slingerland, like it's almost like, I think it's a um, 12 by 15 or something like that. So it's like this, you know, 12 by 15 marching drum Slingerland that he has all the way off to the side. And as you'll see in later photos, he moves it around on the kit. But um, hmm. but now you can see the twelve and the, I mean the thirteen and the fourteen inch toms are mounted off the bass drum, but they're not mounted in the traditional way. So now the badges are facing Alex instead of the audience. So you can also you can tell that they're you know the same toms just mounted because the mufflers are facing out. And yeah, Tony Williams style. Yeah, so they so so that's what's going on with that. Cool looking drum set. I mean, it really is a you know. Um, it's it's the the drum sets of the era are changing and he's right on pace with that you know what i mean with the big bigger drum sets and the double bass drums and all that yeah and uh i just find it interesting how like you know he just well, i don't let's paint the whole thing let's paint the inside you know like okay you know well, there's people like it's more reflective or let's put tin foil on the inside of the drums. It'll be more reflective. I mean, I guess. is it really? Maybe, but it's cool that he tried and it, it does look pretty cool. The light catches it in some of these photos and you kind of, it's, it has a, a look to it. I'm just, you know, as I said, I'm really going to guess that it was purely for like getting more volume out of the kit. And so like here you see them playing, you know, 1975, Edward's now playing a destroyer or some kind of guitar like that. I don't know if it's a destroyer. Huge bell bottoms. Well, and and you'll also note that in the earlier photos that they were wearing all the flannel and all this stuff. Well, when David Lee Roth joined the band, he was the guy that basically like was like, okay, you know, I know you guys like to like slouch around, slouch around in t-shirts and jeans, and and he was the one that got him to get platform shoes and and get the bell bottoms and. And I mean, yeah. as much as, you know, you could rag on Dave for a lot of things like these guys. It's cool. Probably if it was not for Dave, that nobody would have ever heard of Van Halen. And that's an argument for the ages. But like they probably would have been the best known. Like you'd hear guys saying, I remember this backyard party band that was like the killer. But but Dave was the guy that got them like into the clubs. He got them out there. He got yeah. them seen. And, and as much as, you know, he maybe maybe people thought of his shortcomings. He was the guy that really like, you know, put them out in front of the masses. So you got to really totally. give him credit for that. But you can see in the kit, it may look like Alex might have a couple more symbols or, you know, it looks like the symbols have grown a little bit. I'm sure when those guys played gigs and, you know, every penny they had went probably either into the gas tank or into the, you know, buying sticks, buying heads, buying, you know, any yep. piece of gear they could do. Well, it looks like just to kind of touch on symbols, because we know people like all the different very, you know, various things. It looks like there's hi hats and then to his left kind of facing us. It looks like there's two crashes on his left 
on the photo with David that, that you were just yeah. looking at there. And then over on his right, it looks like a ride. Yeah. And then uh, a, another crash over there. Not sure about sizes. I'm sure they're 18 inches or yeah. whatever, 17 inches. And then maybe another symbol off right behind David's hand there. That, But that yeah. might be a part of the background there. I'm not 100% yeah. sure, but nothing too crazy yet, you know. Yeah. You know, as we move along, you can see, you know, there's the Tom again off to the side. You can clearly see the super sensitive snare, the hi hats up, you know, several crashes, but he's got the front heads on there. Um, yeah. With the logos. Yeah. With the logos on there, which is kind of, you know, at this point, unique to see. We're not in any way like a professional sponsored by Ludwig. We're still nope. kind of a party garage band. We meaning <laughs> Van Halen. Yeah. They, they're like, they, they are, right? They, they, they play the clubs. Uh, they eventually got sort of discovered by Gene Simmons, but that's a whole story, and it didn't really go anywhere. But they played the clubs for like basically another year, and it's when they got you know signed by Warner Brothers. But you can see where Alex is you know, still playing the same kit, and these photos from about 1977. You can see you know the kit at this point. You can see the rims look sort of rusted a little bit, almost like yeah, they, like yeah. he's. I mean, they they must have gigged everywhere under the sun. You can see him. You know, and, and those guys, you know, all of them are like stick thin. They, they probably barely ate meals, you know what I mean? Like they just played and played and played. And so, you know, we're moving along. You'll see a good shot of the Slingerland. You can actually see in the Slingerland, like the lug screws that are painted straight over. Like he just literally just painted right over the yeah. things. Yeah, which if you take them out, then you're going to like ruin the, if you can get yeah, them off. Yeah, if you the can get them off, just, they're all stuck. Yeah. And so, so. From there, they uh, those were probably some of the last shots that I have where they were still a club band. And so they got signed by Warner Brothers Records. And basically, they went in and they caught like a um, – they basically had them go into the studio and record this demo. with And basically, the, the thought was like, just guys, rattle off everything you know. We're going to record it. And they did like 25 songs in like one day or something. Then they went back and then they cut the vocals the next day. And so they had this demo. But but um, Ted Templeman, who was the producer, was still busy working with like the Doobie Brothers or somebody. And so they basically had a waiting period, which kind of sucked for them. But they, uh, they had this period where they just really didn't gig all that much. And they were waiting, just basically going to the studio to cut the actual album. So by... Um, I want to say it was like August, late August, September of uh, 77. They finally went into Sunset Sound and recorded the album. Uh, they banged it out pretty quickly. And uh, and uh, and then after that, it was, you know, basically like taking promo shots and getting ready. Yeah. You know, they had to wait and prepare for a tour. So um, they got these shots that were like used for the, out to the album cover. There's a t outtake shot from the album cover. And you can see he's playing the same, you know, Silver Sparkle kit. And at this point now, you can see he's playing peisty symbols so somewhere along the line he got his uh you know he got like bona fide real peisty symbols and he was playing 2002s black labels and you can see he's playing um like uh black dot heads so this shot is from an actual they did a promo video for a couple of a couple of the songs on the album and it was you know before mtv and all that but i guess it was just a way to sort of showcase the band so they went yeah. to like um I guess they went to the Whiskey A Go Go and filmed these promo videos, but you can see now he's got that Slingerland Tom placed in the center of the of the two toms, where it would remain for the you know duration of the entire first tour. He's got the front heads on there, and so the other thing big change you'll notice is he's got the elongated bass drums. So basically, what he did was he had the you know the, those are the same bass drums that he had probably since 1970, but he bought another 14 by 24, another 14 by 26, and he joined them together. And he joined them together by using like, I don't know if he like screwed them together somehow, but he covered up whatever the seams were with a big leather strap on each one that went around the bass drum. The other thing to note, and I've asked a few people that are more in the know with this than me, but his drum tech that he actually had, whose name was Greg Emerson, was basically a high school buddy of his. I don't think the guy even played instrument at all, but it was yeah. like Alex's best buddy, best friend. And the guy basically started working for Alex probably some point in the club days. And it was probably one of those situations where like he followed the band around, helped move equipment, you know, hung out with his buddies and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it eventually morphed into, you know, now is his best friend out on the road with him and this and that. And so yeah. um, from what I understand, I've heard that Greg, 
was probably a little bit handy as well. So all of the kits that got customized by Alex and stuff, uh, would I, I'm almost positive that the Greg likely had a hand in helping Alex do the work. But again, and here we are talking about, you know, those guys got signed in 1977 and, uh, and everybody looks at that album that sold so many, you know, over 10 million copies. Well, when those guys got signed, they didn't become instant millionaires. They were still broke for quite a while. They were, Eddie yeah. and Alex lived at home until probably about the third or fourth record. And so they really did not have any extra money, but here Alex went out and bought a brand new 14 by 24 14 by 26, you'll see coming up in some of these later photos, I was always wondering, because the switch from three-ply to six-ply shells occurred around, you know, some point, maybe either 76 or 77. So I'd always kind of wondered, okay, so when he got the new drums, did he get six-ply shells or did he get three-ply shells? I, I was always kind of curious mm. as to what the deal was with yeah. that. But, but again, it's always funny to note that he probably spent a you know a small fortune on a fourteen by twenty six and a twenty four, and the first thing he did was screw and you know, put screws into it and, and drilled yeah, them into the it. front of the you know existing drums. It, so, is that something that has happened with another famous drummer that he liked to like elongate their bass drum? Is that like a thing that you know, has been done before? I I would probably like to guess that he may not have been the first one to do it, but yeah. I but. I, I don't, I've never really seen anybody do it before him. I don't know what, you know, I get the, he, he, Eddie gets a lot of credit for being the guy that changed guitar and he was always a thinker and a tinkerer. And, but, you know, yeah. Alex was pretty much, you know, in my mind, he was just as creative and just as uh, ingenuitive and always thinking outside the box a lot like Eddie. I mean, yeah. Alex may have been more of an in the box kind of a person. Than, than Edward, but um, but Alex certainly was a very creative individual that really like thought, you know, and, and I think he also really knew how to think for the show. Like, you know, as we'll see as we move into these other kits, that they're basically like, you know, it's all about the show. You know, yeah. do I need 25 drums? Probably not. <laughs> do I need 25 cymbals? Probably not. I could do everything yeah. I need on a four-piece kit, probably, but it's like, you know, we're putting on a show that's larger than life. We want people to walk out of here and go, what the heck did I just see? And it worked, you know? And so, so Alex elongated these bass drums. And, and the other thing that I'd be really curious to know, because all, all of his kits, you know, pretty much after this had an elongated bass drum. It's like, how did they fit them into a case? Like, where did they, where did they go? Yeah, like, really? Yeah. Like that it's, they're just, they're huge. They're long. Yeah. Uh, and they must not have, they must've been extremely cumbersome to haul around. And it's also funny to see the fire extinguisher too, because I was just going to say, yeah, like that's where that began. Well, it began there, but the fire extinguisher, as you'll see later on, was really like there when he had a gong and they would light the gong on fire. But prior gotcha. to that, there really wasn't a need for a fire extinguisher. Maybe it was just for it just looked it just, cool, I guess. Yeah, it's more I, I mean, stuff. And, I could yeah. be wrong about that, but I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a picture. Because you got to remember in that first tour, they were still an opening act. So they originally opened for Journey and Montrose and then quickly yeah. ended up uh, moving over to Black Sabbath. And so there wasn't really a lot of room for them to really do much else other than because they had, you know, Bill Ward had a big drum set with Black Sabbath and then you got Alex's silver kit in front of it. And it's like, there just wasn't room for much else back there. And certainly not for a flame show. You know what I mean? Like, no, no. And so, so anyway, there's, so that's, you know, there's some cool pictures there. Uh, you know, there's the kit again, when they're playing live, yeah. and you see Bill Ward's kit behind him. But the other, there's some really cool pictures that I found, and I think they came from a Japanese book somehow, but somebody, you know, and I'd love to just think, thanks to this guy, took some excellent pictures of, of behind the kit. So here's a great shot of, you know, the kit. You see the, the um, super sensitive snare. You can see, you know, the ghost pedals. He was playing ghost yeah. pedals. You yeah. see like the Atlas hardware. I mean, you see how dirty the snare drum is. The thing probably played forever. And the other thing that Alex did with that snare drum, and it's I don't think I have a picture where you can see it, but a super sensitive was really meant for like classical music. They used yeah, like them in orchestral. You know, orchestral, symphonic. And so when you're yeah. playing, you know, heavy backbeats on them, the snare throw off would tend to sort of disengage because mm. most people were playing, you know, 
you know, light rudiments on them and things like that. And, and you know, they weren't really bashing on them like two and four. And so <laughs> the Alex had this problem where the throw-off would disengage. And so he used like a spring from like a carburetor or, or a, you know, maybe an engine somewhere. And he basically like, got this, you know, put the screw through the throw off and then attach it to the drum. So the throw off wouldn't disengage anymore. And it's cool that it's from a carburetor. It just feels right. I, I and think like, it was, I mean, I mean, I could yeah. be wrong, but I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, but it's ingenuity again, and it's best, you know, you figure out why something doesn't work and you fix it. It looks like there's wooden, uh, beaters on his bass drum pedals on that, on that one picture. He does tend to like wooden bass drum beaters. Uh, I think he got more crack and snap out of him. But the other cool thing to note when I finally saw these pictures is that it solved the mystery for me. If, now, if you look at that picture of the left bass drum, you can see that clearly the front bass drum is painted white inside. So that's the original 1970 bass drum that got painted white inside. But the bass drum behind it is a clear interior, but you can actually see the re-ring in the front. So clearly he must have got you know a 14 by 26 and a 24 it was a three ply shell still. So it was probably like some of the last three ply shells before the switch to a six ply. But you can see yeah. how they're, you know, he's got chain, chains at the top of the bass drum. The other thing I noticed in this photo, and I wondered about this and I read about it somewhere, if you look at the floor tom on the right, the 16, there's almost like a hole above the top of where the um, leg is. And from what I understand or what I've heard, which is just another thing that just blows my mind is all because of the show. But I guess Alex in the club days used to have this trick where he would basically like he caught a hole in the side of his floor tom and he put a tube in there. And basically like he would blow into this tube and it would raise and lower the pitch of the drum. <laughs> and so, awesome. so here we again, you know, let's cut a hole in the side of a drum that, you know, like. Okay. Really nice drum. Yeah, yeah, let's you know, let's just cut a hole in it and throw a plastic tube in there so that we can whack the drum during a drum solo and make the pitch go up and down. Like it's That's all about cool. the show. I've never heard of that. I, wow. I, and I just, you know, I'd heard of it, but when I was looking at this photo, I was like, geez, I wonder if that's where the hole was. Like I've heard that he did it. I've I've seen people in interviews talk about him doing this crazy drum solo where the pitch would change. And and the other thing to note in this photo too, you can see at the very top, he always had a cowbell. I was just looking at that. Yeah, it's come. Yep. It's it's weird. It's the placement of it is a little in the way. It it kind of is, but I, it's. I mean, obviously, it's his setup, and he is comfortable with it. But it's interesting. And the other thing to note too, when I was so going through the gear stuff, and and John Douglas was talking about all of the gear, which you know. I, again, I will probably defer to him because he's, you know, Alex's friend. He's been in tech for years, but he says on all the early kits that Alex was playing a 24 inch ride, but I almost think it's a 22 because um, when you look at some of these photos that I got coming up, that just a 24 is huge. It just doesn't look as big as a 24 to me, but, but then again, my eyes could be playing tricks on me. The other thing you'll note in these photos is, um, uh, and then this will sort of play into later. You can see the strap where the, you know, the leather strap is between the lugs, but you can see on that snare drum, you'll see how the blue olive badge is slightly tilted. It's like when they put it on at the factory, it wasn't straight and they just yeah. stuck it on there. A couple of more photos from the, you know, the, some, whoever took these photos. So it's like, thank you very much. I mean, these are great photos and yeah. uh, you can see all the, the, the different, the definite things going on with the uh, the kit and this and that, the gas mask again. And, and again, because people are just listening, now we're looking at a photo that is like, it's just, that's just for cool factor, right? Yeah. That is, let's put this gas mask, and then we've got a chain wrapped around it. We've The, the two bass yeah. drums connected. And you can see in these photos, really, like the, the bolts and things yeah. where these two bass drums were. And it is very cool. There's a couple more photos. There's him on, you know, somewhere on tour. It's a pretty cool photo. Another very cool looking gas mask. Yeah, on, the gas uh, mask hanging off the front. You know, sometimes I think he would put it on during his, um, you know, solo. He would throw the thing on. It just looked look funny. So yeah. after they finished up the Van Halen 1 tour, they literally, and this is a common theme with Van Halen, they never stopped. They literally got back and Warner Brothers basically... They sold like a million units and basically Warner Brothers told them they owed them like $2 million. Like, and they were just like, wait, what? And so <laughs> literally like they went back into the studio probably like a week after they finished the tour. And so to record Van Halen too. And fortunately they had some of the songs already written, but when Alex went in the studio, he likely took that silver sparkle kit, 
recorded it again, but this time, instead of like, whereas in, I think the first album, all the bottom heads and the front heads on the bass drums were off. These had the bottom heads and everything on, and you can definitely tell the difference when you listen to Van Halen too. The toms are a little more tonal. There's a little more resonance coming out of the drums. And and yeah. also, and I don't know if I noted this in the when they recorded Van Halen 1, the bass drums were still the single, you know, they weren't elongated yet. It was the period between after the album was recorded and um, they went on tour where they had this downtime of a couple of months before the, you know, the album was released. They went on tour somewhere in that vicinity is when Alex decided to elongate the bass drums. So when they recorded Van Halen 2, now you, they were, the bass drums were, you'll see in this picture, there's a picture of that sunset sound. The bass drums are, you know, obviously they're elongated. The other thing to note about this picture is you'll see stainless steel drums in this picture. I have been told, although I, I it's hard to know because you, you can see all the microphones mic got everything mic'd up, but it has been told to me that basically that this photo was sort of a prop photo. Like the band, there's a bunch of photos of the band in the studio, beer cans all over the floor and trash everywhere. And it was supposedly, you know, they brought in photographer Neil Lower and uh, to to basically like photograph them in the studio, but they sort of mm. threw trash around and made it look like it was a little more like you know, of a ruckus scenario than it probably was. Yeah, I mean, it seems kind of staged, like the, what looks like a Sennheiser, the 421, yeah. the Sennheiser in the back above his like octobon looking drums isn't yeah. plugged in. And then also you'd think the engineer would go like, he'd come in and be like, all right, I'm hearing a rattle. Oh, yeah. maybe it's the chains or it's the fire extinguisher. Oh, wait, maybe it's the gas mask. Like when they really, really record, right. recorded it. I wonder if they took that stuff off. Yeah, it's yeah, and it's hard to know. But um, the other cool thing to note in this 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 set is you know you'll see the stainless steel toms, which you know will lead into his next tour kit. But it's likely that when you know he um, took this picture, I'm guessing that you know because they elongated the stainless steel bass drums too, that maybe they weren't either they hadn't been completed yet or they weren't finished or whatever it was, and so maybe he got the toms ahead of the the bass drums. But either way, it's a it's a uh, a hodgepodge of both kits in this photo. But one of the things you'll note is that there's another super sensitive to his right on the floor, right next to Eddie's, you know, unfinished amplifier cab. Um, so my point was bringing up the, the snare drum. And then here's a promo shot from Van Halen too. And you can see that he put the Slingerland over on the, um, you know, the far, far right, just because they probably yeah. wanted to get a good photo shot of him. And the thing kind of was in his way. I, I never liked that Slingerland Tom in the front because whenever, you know, they put him on a riser and he was up there, that thing just basically covered the entire front of him. Yeah. And to me, the I've never liked the, and I, you know, I know this is going to be, I'm sure someone's going to disagree, but like, even like back when like Louis Belson or someone would play that giant kind of floor Tom in the middle. Yeah. To me, I've never been a big fan of that look of having one big kind of drum in the middle with the triple. It, it's just a little much. But, I, I um, agree again, with you. Everyone can like different stuff this but. is the way i like to see this kit i like seeing the slingerland off to the side i like seeing it you know this way you know in, in my opinion this is the yeah. way i feel like he's got the you know the 26 on his <clears throat> right foot side and you know back in the club days you'll notice that he you know flip-flopped sometimes the 24 was over there but he's got the 26 this way and are these octobonds? I mean, I don't know if they yeah, are officially octobonds. Can, are those those are a new addition yeah and you the octobonds appeared probably late later in the tour from 1978 when they were out with Black Sabbath. I told you before how, um, you know, why I covered this kit in so much detail. Uh, uh, I spent so much time in this particular kit, and it's one of my favorites because you can see the history it has when you go all the way back to that 1970 photo of them in their living room, all the way up to <laughs> the first cool. tour and the second recording, the second album. And, I mean, there's a lot of Van Halen history made with those drums. And yeah. Alex, apparently he donated them to a hard rock that's over in Europe somewhere. So this is the kit as it is today. And of course, just like every hard rock, they have no clue how to set the thing up. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it looks like crap, you know. No one's legs would be that far. Yeah, it's, it's you know, they got the toms in the wrong spot, the slinger in the wrong place, you know, it should be on a snare stand. They got this um, no-name, you know, snare drum because the super sensitive is not with the kit. Regardless, it is the kit. The kit, you know, it's nice to know that it's still, it exists, it's alive. 
Those bass drums look so long in this picture. They they, look like, they do. They're just it's a, it's probably just the angle of the photo, the perspective. Yeah, I, yeah. I would just like to see this kit with like the bottom heads on, the toms in the right spot. Uh, you know, a correct snare drum with it. And it, it, in my opinion, I know as I said that Alex isn't overly sentimental, but this is one of the kits that I think that you know you need to hang on to this one. This one needs to be yeah. somewhere in real Van Halen history because there are so many miles on this kit. You think about every club day, every club show. I mean, literally, you know, 10 years worth of use on it. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, come on. This is like unbelievable, the amount of history that goes behind this kit. The other thing I wanted to note, uh, you know, when we finish up with this, the Silver Sparkle kit, is at some point down the road, it came into light that there was a super sensitive snare being sold that belonged to Alex. Now, I won't want to. I don't want to give away names. I don't want to give away, you know, who, what. But I know the sna snare drum in this picture literally came from Alex's warehouse. I mean, it's you know, obviously that's his signature on it. It's mm -hmm. it's legitimately his drum. But the drum was told to uh, to be the drum that he used on the first album and tour. Now the thing that I find interesting is clearly it was it was his drum and it was clearly he used it. But if you look in this next photo, that photo I showed you earlier, see how the badge is crooked? Yeah, uh, you can see that the super sense the super sensitive that was sold, the badge is straight as an arrow. And yeah. so the way it's supposed to be. The way really. it's supposed to be. So my guess is if you look at the photos, again, going back to you know, the double base kit here, you can see there's a second super sensitive on the floor next to him. I have a feeling that he probably acquired another drum at some point. And um, basically probably when he got the stainless steel kit. And so if I were to make any kind of a real guess, I would say that maybe you're looking at the one that's being sold is actually the second drum. Still his drum. It's still, still his drum. He probably used it on all kinds of crap. It just, you know, yeah, I don't, yeah. it, it, and of course, you know, Alex, told this person that, you know, hey, I used it on the first album, but like, you know, if you're looking at a drum where they made millions of them and they all look alike and you look quick, you might be able, you, you just might not know, like, uh, I mean and I'm not yeah. trying to discredit Alex in any way, shape, or form, I'm just going no, no, by no. CSI investigative you know, pictures <laughs> and I'm looking at a crooked badge versus one that's not, but... Yeah, but, DNI drum, drum nerd investigators. And, and, but there are case. plenty of pictures of Alex later on playing a super sensitive with a perfectly straight badge, so like, yeah. you know, Could including the jump video, you know what I mean? So I mean, like, I, there's no doubt in my mind that he used that drum. It just may not be the drum that was used on Van Halen 1. So that, that's all I'm saying. And the only other way for me to really would know for sure was if I could see the drum in person and look at the serial number. The serial number might tell me that it was a later date or an earlier date, sure. but I don't sure. have access to it and I don't know what it is. And lastly, this is a picture of his tech, Greg Emerson, which is, as I said, is like his best friend. So we move on from, uh, you know, the quick period where they had basically, you know, it's reported like two, three weeks to basically bang out Van Halen 2. They go back straight out to the road, don't even stop for two minutes, and Alex gets this you know, stainless steel kit. Is he sponsored at this point? He is, is like, is Ludwig aware of him? I mean, I'm sure they got to be aware of him, but he is not officially sponsored by Ludwig. And I don't actually think, you know, and I, I've, I've asked around about this. I don't honestly think he got sponsored and this was his choice till about 1983, uh, oh, okay, which seems wow. really odd to me. You would have thought it would have been a lot more before that. I mean, I think he probably was able to get anything he wanted with not little, very little problem, but I don't think yeah. he officially became an endorser till about 83. And the other thing okay. is, I don't think he became a, he was probably, I think he became a Peisty endorser first. And, um, and he also, uh, it basically has been noted that he has had basically four endorsements that he's used his entire career. So Regal Tip being one of them, Remo Heads, uh, Ludwig, and Peisty Symbols. And so I think Peisty was probably at least, you know, probably around 79. I'm not real sure. So here he is playing this newly um, uh, stainless steel kit. Once again, you see him sitting practically on the floor. He's got the, you know, the hi-hats all the way up. And then he's got like, um, I guess it was noted in the um, the gear book that they're like motorboat headers that he used to, you know, for the bass drum. And um, the sizes of the kit were, again, you know, you have a, uh, a 26 and a 24 that were long, elongated, but then you have like a 12, a 13, and a 14-inch tom. And his floor toms actually went from 18 to 20. 
instead of 16 to 18. He went from like 18 to 20. You can see in this picture, you can see the Ludwig logo on one of the, the symbol stands. You see he's playing 2002 Pisces. But then he added these uh, clear octobands. He had like two six inch out in the front. He had uh, two eight inch to the left. And then he had four eight inch ones over, off, over the floor toms. And you'll note that the ones over to his left are actually turned the opposite way. And it's because um, during the song, Light Up the Sky, where there's a little bit of a drum solo at the end, Eddie would come over and use a stick, and he would sort of, like, everybody would just walk around the kit with a pair of sticks. Oh, Michael, cool. David, Eddie, and Eddie used to, and, and this kind of remained a theme for a, a couple of years where they would either have a set of timbales or a set of, um, you know, the octobands pointed in the opposite direction so Eddie could play them. It looks like the cowbell moved over to his side. Yep hi-hat level yeah you know. it looks like he moved it over there it's easier to play songs like dance the night away with it off to the side and um and then the other note is uh that same japanese book that i showed with the uh the one kit they also did the second kit so the thing that blows my mind is that 12 inch tom that's over on his left like it's crammed right in there like underneath the hi-hat like i just like you know you still see the ghost pedals with the wooden beaters you you can see, but you know, and and the ride symbol that looks like a twenty two inch to me, and not a twenty four. But again, I could be mistaken. But he's still playing a super sensitive snare drum. Which which one it is is you know who knows. I mean, maybe they brought two on tour and they swap swapped them depending on what one we need. You see, he's playing block black dot heads. But it just blows my mind. Like if I had that Tom right there where he has it, I, there's be no doubt in my mind that I'd be cutting my hand wide open with that thing. Yeah, we've all cut our fingers a couple. I times mean, look at that there, thing. It's it, it's just he it's, has an interesting setup. That's for uh, sure. It's crazy. It's just like tucked way in there, and um, the kit must have weighed a thousand pounds. Like I feel <laughs> so bad for Greg Emerson that like, I mean, like, like number one, they get again, they got to find a case for these elongated what did i say they're 28 by 26 and 28 by 24 and you got to find a case for them and then you know say they're in a foam case you got to lift them out of the case yeah. i mean two two stainless steel bass drums must have weighed an absolute ton and I, they would have to un like ratchet off and reattach those i, like, I just i would but literal exhaust header you know the pipes from a boat they'd have to reattach those uh, i just unattached. there's so many things that would be interesting to know and the other thing to note is i you, i can guarantee that they figured out how to do this as efficiently and quickly as possible yeah. because once i said earlier not to rag on him but greg emerson was alex's buddy and i'm sure he was pretty hot to trot to join in the action like after the gig yeah. was over and you know who wants to spend <laughs> you know five hours putting away a 26 piece drum set you know so no you want to go party Ghost pedals you don't hear about too often because they didn't have that long of a run. I, there's an episode about Ludwig pedals that's been on the podcast, but um, those were not that common to see out and about. No, I have one here, and I've actually played them. You know, back in the '90s, I kind of got into them a little bit, and they were actually kind of fun to play. But I've heard horror stories about like if you t tension them the wrong way, like the spring breaks in there, you never want to open one up because you'll basically you could get murdered by opening up because the spring will Springs. come out and just like it'll just cut you into shreds because they're just so <laughs> sharp and it'll turn you into a ghost. Oh, geez. <laughs> but you know, in a little quick brief history, the ghost, of course, named after a battleship or whatever. But anyway, yeah. but Alex yeah. preferred ghost pedals. I guess he used them for quite some time, and eventually yeah. he gave them up because they just, you know, harder to find. They didn't make them anymore, and he just probably wanted to go with something that was a little more readily available and reliable on the road. But I think sure. he really liked the ghost pedal quite a bit. Yeah. But this is definitely a unique setup for sure. And and once yeah. again, when I'm looking at that ride symbol, it looks to me like a 22 inch. Especially when I'm looking at like that, you know, the second floor tom is supposedly an 18 by an 18 by 20. You know, I mean, like yeah, it doesn't look that much the, the ride does not size. look like a 24 to me. And that's just me. So no. And, and it's it's just the little things, too. We can point out like there's a there's one stick ready to go kind of coming out from the top of his bass drum where yeah. I remember doing the Lars series and um it would be like he would use half a cymbal stand with a stick sticking down into the cymbal yeah. stand to get it. Because now, I mean, when we think they had stick bags. Looks like there's some sticks down there on his between the floor toms. Yep. But like to get that one ready to go, now we all have those little kind of like stick 
holder that goes off your hi hat. Oh yeah, yeah. Not, that wasn't the case then. So he that was kind of his ready to go one yeah. in the you know. And it upper. should be noted, you know, I mean, I don't know, like I'm not certainly not an expert on his sticks, but he used a very big stick. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I have a picture I'll be showing later on. You can actually see, but but he used like a three S marching style stick. I mean, they were they wow. were literally baseball bats and uh, mm. very huge. And then later on, of course, he had a uh, a regal tip special stick, and they were long and much longer than I would normally use. So here he is, you know, customary, you know, drinking his drink. And, and at some point, they put stickers on all the drums just to, for the hell of it. You know, the flammable on there. Like, it just looks cool. It, it's, it looks cool. I mean, again, for people just listening, it's got literally just numbers. Like, you would go and buy as, like, you'd put them as, like, your address or something. Like, 19, 18, 4. They've got, it's almost like airplane sort of themed. Yeah, kind of and like who flammable. knows? Maybe it helped out Greg. I don't know, you know. I certainly would have wanted to number some of the later kits. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, but it's like maybe write a put a little tiny note on the inside, not like a go to a hardware store and get a four by four sticker and slap it on the front. But yeah. it does really look cool, and the flammable looks awesome. I mean, these are yeah, it's iconic. it's iconic. And, and 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 of course, at this point now too, you'll see he's got the the fire extinguisher down there and all that. You know, the china yeah. up there. And he's got the uh, the octo bands off the side. But as we move to this photo, you'll see. Everything's in flames because they put lighter fluid on all the heads and all that. I mean, imagine seeing that at the end of a concert. It's like, holy, it's awesome. you know, and, yeah. and that's you know, clearly why you needed the fire extinguisher. And as you'll note, as you look at pictures of Alice from like the 1980 tour, his hair is a lot shorter. And it's, you know, it's been, it's been said that he singed his hair off doing this, but no big surprise. I mean, you can't tell me, you know, that, that I mean, that looks pretty dangerous. I don't know how long yeah. the flames were like that, but it's cool. That's it's, all that it's matters. It's cool, you know, and it was a, and you can, and I think as the tour went on, he added more octobands. You can, you know, it's almost like you can see more in the front there. Yeah. There's just, yeah. they just, you know, he like, that's the problem with like outlining these kits. This is like, he was constantly, you know, evolution, changing the kit, adding more symbols, trying a different one. Maybe if a symbol broke, they would, you know, I mean, I, you know, Alex, has admittedly said in the early days he was more of a crash and bash. Although, you know, I still found his playing and his technique to be very um, musical and very, I, I feel like he was very um, articulate in the way he played. Oh, my God. Incredible. You know, but even yeah. though, you know, he claims that he didn't really start learning proper rudiment and technique until about the second album. And I'm guessing mm -hmm. that, you know, when they toured that first tour and they toured with Journey and Montrose, Steve Smith was on his first year in Journey. And so, of course, if you're spending a tour or a part of the tour, because they didn't tour very long with Journey because they basically outsold him with tickets and all. Yeah. But if you're spending a tour with Steve Smith, who's probably like a practice hound, and the guy like basically is like a student of the drums and he's just an incredible technician, some of that's got to rub off on you. And I've heard yeah. stories where, you know, I think Alex and, you know, Steve probably used to warm up a little bit. But yeah. it's got to be, it had to be most inspirational to watch a guy like Steve Smith do a warm up. I mean, the guy was, yeah. a, the guy was just incredible. So, absolutely. Um, so, as we're looking at these pictures here, like, you know, the ones where they're starting to get the flammable and the, mm -hmm. uh, the octobons all over, what year are we at? So, we're in 1979, uh, Van Halen 2 tour. Okay. So he's like twenty six, yeah, -ish. and they and they just literally like were having the time of their lives. The band was still very much a unit, and they were functional, and they were they were cranking along, and and it was basically album tour, album tour, and they were just you know again having the time of their lives doing this stuff. And so here's another shot of the kit from the front, and I'm not really sure where this was taken or on stage or whatever, but but you can see how there's plenty of the you know the octo bands in view. He has tons of them there, man. I mean, and they're all miked. I mean, there there's one, two, three, four, yeah. five, six, seven, or eight of them that I'm seeing. So as we as we move along into the kits, you'll see that'll be one of my comments is like some poor schmuck had to mic all this stuff. You know what I mean? And there's you yeah. know they mic'd all of it, and it, it's insane to me. So and you can yeah. also see like the bass drums. As far as I can tell in this picture, there's no muffling whatsoever. I don't even see a felt strip. And, no. it, and it's, uh, I mean, it's just a wide open 26 and a 24, you know, elongated bass drums. Like, I mean, they must have been like little cannons. Uh, you can see in this photo here that this is a, you know, the silver, this is a stainless steel kit that he donated to a hard rock somewhere. 
and he autographed all the heads. And that top in the top, you can see there's a super sensitive hanging between all the different drums. And, uh, you know, the boat headers must have been something they just sort of put in place as a, like a decoration because you can clearly see the, the bass drums have their, you know, typical 70s curve spur, you know, Ludwig spurs on them. And so, um, so you can see, you know, there's the stainless steel kit. I mean, that thing must have weighed, you know, quite a bit. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of fingerprints, you know? So that takes us out of Van Halen too. And, and once again, 1979 into 1980, they literally came home, barely, barely had a break and went straight into the studio and recorded a woman and children first. Uh, all these albums so far being recorded at sunset sound studios. And so for the tour, this is where Alex started to really bring out some creativity. So he has this white kit, and you'll see that it's, again, you know, surrounded by 2002 Pisces. He's got some Tama Octobands in the front. He's got like a little uh, Tama, a 12 by 10 single-headed Tom off, you know, to the, the far left. But the bass drums are the interesting thing. They're basically 50 by 26. And I say 50 because they're... I don't even really know how you measure them because, yeah. Um, as you'll see when I look at some of these other photos, um, the bass drums had, you know, basically like tubing material inside of them, and basically they were able to sort of snake around. And so, yeah, they're like um, again for for our non YouTube friends here, they're like it's like industrial, it's like industrial rubber, I would imagine, but it's bolted on. Yeah, it's bolted on. You can see he's got another flammable sticker on the bass drum. Um, you know, more fire extinguishers. But the other thing you'll note in some of these photos as we get along here, here's a great shot from behind. Um, he added a 40-inch a symphonic gong. Now, you can also see where he's got, you know, the same the little tom crammed in under the hi-hat. But the cool thing you can see when you're looking at this photo is, I think it's this photo, um, or it might be one similar, but they have basically like a gas line that runs up the, the, the length of the gong, you know, the gong thing. So at the end of the show, when he's bashing the gong, the whole thing lights up, lights up, you know, but this time, instead of haphazardly, they probably figured out pretty quickly that dumping lighter fluid on a drum kit was probably not the, the best idea. And so no. they, they probably rigged it up a way, much like you would use a gas grill where they had a wire that went around the gong. You know, you turn on the gas, light it up like a, like a grill, and, and yeah. the gong goes up in flames and when you're done with it. And you, know, you, you turn the gas off, you know. That's like movies. Like I was listening to something the other day about how they made the movie The Thing. And they were like, all right, we just turn on the gas line and then yeah. the whole room would light on fire. And then we need to shoot it again. Okay, turn the gas off. It's like, yeah, they're getting smarter with all of that. They're getting smarter. Know. They got a, probably a little bit of money. Now they're starting to make a little bit of money. The albums are selling. Eddie was really becoming widely known as, you know, the greatest guitar player. And Alex is, you know, of course, you know. He's playing this this crazy kit that he devised, came up with, with these weird yep. bass drums. You can see that um, he's now added these pearl, very pitch toms. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 I which see. are sort of a competitor to roto toms. They're like roto toms and pearls sort of, you know, mixed. With a shell. With a shell. And so um, the kit that he's playing here actually was auctioned off several years back. So there's some really great photos of it. You can see, you know, this is it. Somebody actually really set it up the correct way, but um, it's not you know it's not his biggest kit by any means. But you but you can see those bass drums are very unique in the way they they you know they sort of elongate and move around. And he loves to tape the the tape setup for his his you know kind of kick pad. Yeah, is I mean, that's some muffling right there, of course. Oh yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. That, yeah that, that handles some muffling. Here you're putting, but you're also playing a wood beater, and it's probably helping the head last longer and and it probably gives it a little bit you know there's like if you look at these kick drums and i'm sure you know granted this is years after alex was done playing the set i don't think he actually used any muffling in there anyway and like so i'm sure they helped muffle the kicks a little bit and then the front bass drum head in one of these pictures you've provided here looks like it's got that where it was a, a thing at the time where you just basically leave the edge of yeah. on, on the front yeah. head you leave the edge of the head, so you do have a head on. You can yep. keep the rim on, and yep. then you can see the Ludwig logo. But. Yeah, and he's playing you know, silver dart heads, and he's got um, you know, and at this point too, you can see where he started like taping the snare drum up. Uh, later on, you'll see where he gets more of a a famous thing going with the snare drum. So that's basically the 1980 kit. So we uh, you know, they toured with that. Um, 
again, you know, I know it's going to sound redundant, but they literally went from the 1980 tour back into the studio again, recorded, you know, the next down, which was fair warning. Now, the things that I don't really know, and I've never really heard, and I've always been curious to know, is that Alex has always claimed that, you know, whatever I take in the road, I kept taking the studio, but I have a hard time believing that he took that white kid into the sunset sound to record fair warning. Like, you know, like it just seems a little over the top yeah. to bring a kit like yeah. that when you're, you know, no one's going to know the difference when you're listening to a record. So it's hard for me to know exactly what he took into the studio, but, but on some of those studio recordings, like fair warning and all that, you can definitely hear, him playing like, you know, an eight inch or 10 inch Tom somewhere. So, or even in, um, you know, women and children first, you can hear some either roto Toms or very pitch Toms or whatever they are. So he clearly had some of that stuff in there with him. Uh, he yeah, brought him along, sure. but I mean, but it, how much of it he really brought to the studio is not really the known slinky, to me. The slinky bass drum wouldn't be as necessary for when no one sees it. It's like, yeah, you, you know. would think it would be a little part. But again, Alex has claimed that, you know, all that stuff was used in the studio. And then, you know, yeah. I took this, I included this one picture just because they uh, they made some promo videos along the way. And sometimes, like, they'd be on a TV show or they'd be on something where they had to mime along to the song. So, of course, Alex is playing like this. I think it's a Slingerland kit. And you see the names blocked off on the on the top. Oh, sure. And uh, and again, I don't think he was a Ludwig endorser, but he just blocked off the Slingerland name. And you can see those are those Slingerland 70s toms that had like sort of a cut in them. But they were recording, you know, Eddie's got the outfit he wore all through the 1981 tour where he's all striped up. And, and Michael yeah. Anthony's wearing his like, you know, parachute jumpsuit. Um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, they like the look of it. And before we move on, I just want to say too that like, he has the slinky kind of tubing on his cymbal stands and his tom mounts. And yep. I mean, like there's some design and really some thought going into these drum yeah. sets. You <clears> know <throat> what I mean? Like it's a stage design. It looks great. And you can also see too, like in this particular kit, he painted the shells inside black. He either wanted it to look that way or he thought it might project a little more. It's hard to know. He uh, definitely had some, uh, some ideas, but the big, huge change coming up for the Fair Warning album and one of the biggest signature Van Halen things is um, this is around the period where Alex acquired the famous Tom of Rosewood snare. And so mm. uh, I know it's been talked about um, that Alex had this Tom of Rosewood snare and not really much was known about it other than the fact that you know, like I'm not a I'm not a Tom historian by any means. So these Tom guys would probably, you know, know ten times more than I would. But there's a picture of Alex, you know, from that tour, and he's got the snare drum there chained to him. And um yeah. but I took this photo came from just somewhere on the internet and I found it of it's basically a Tama, uh, a mastercraft, I believe is what it's called. And they call looks like they call those coffin lugs. And so when I was actually years ago, and this actually plays in, when I was looking around uh, eBay one time, I found one of these that somebody was selling, and this may even be the picture of the one that was being sold. But the guy that was selling it actually had this real cool story, and I don't know if I ever would have heard this any other way or found this out, but the guy basically claims that he bought it from the original owner, and now he had to sell it. But the original owner that bought it was a store employee at some Okay, so he worked at a place called Doctor Music in Pasadena, and according to the guy selling the drum, the person that sold it to him said that um, Alex and Eddie came into Doctor Music as they oftentimes would to look at gear or whatever, and this Tama Rosewood snare that was brand new, they had a couple of them in the store, and Alex tried it out and fell in love with it and immediately purchased this Tama drum. Well, the store, the guy employee that sold him the drum thought, well, geez, maybe Alex is onto something, you know? So he decided to buy the other one they had in the store. And so mm. the guy wow. that had this other one basically had it all these years. And then he sold it to the guy who was selling it on eBay, who had to sell it for whatever reason. But it, it's kind of a cool story because it sort of gives a timeline as to what Alex had. And then, and it also, the guy's drum that he was selling was literally probably the identical drum that Alex ended up purchasing. And so, and you can see that, uh, unlike the super sensitive, there's a different type of a throw off system on it. And the biggest noted differences is the, um, die cast tubes that are on it. Like kind of like what Gretsch would used to use. 
it it is a beautiful drum, and it's uh, those are expensive. I mean, they now are, I'm pretty, they're very expensive. They are extremely expensive now, worth a lot of money if you can even find one. And so, yeah. Alex actually, um, I believe if I listen to the album, I mean, my ears, I I think he used it on probably about sixty to seventy percent of the album. Whereas, and I feel like he used like I feel like on like songs like Unchained and uh, maybe like. Um, so this is love. I think it, it sounds to me like the super sensitive he had been using previously all along, but on songs like um, Mean Streets and uh, um, Push Comes to Sh uh, Shove, maybe um, um, Sinner Swing, it sounds like the Tom of Rosewood. You know, it's got a distinctive sort of a woody sound to it. And it's actually yeah. basically everybody calls Eddie's guitar tone the brown sound, but Eddie actually coined the term. Actually, he coined it off of Alex's snare drum sound because he basically thought the sound of Alex's snare drum reminded of, of somebody like beating on a hollow log, which is probably the sound <laughs> that Alex got out of the Tom of Rosewood, most likely. So that was yeah. probably likely the inspiration. So so when they actually, you know, they finished the album, they went back straight back on tour again. This kit is just insane kit. Like, so this is the, this is the kit when I was, you know, I started playing drums in 1982 and I was 11 years old and my brother was bringing home, you know, he brought home the first couple of Van Halen records and he brought home Diver Down, which had just come out. And basically like a, either this picture or one very much like it was on the back cover and not knowing, yeah. not even hearing a note from the band, not even knowing anything about them. I was like, what is that? What is yeah, that? It, and I mean, it's just monster, it's a monster black and kit. white stripe. Yes. And, you know, of course, he's got a pair of sunglasses on, a big grin from ear to ear. It, it looks yeah. like, you know, he's commanding the SS Alex up there. I mean, it's 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 Four huge. bass drums. And so, of course, yeah. as you can see over my shoulder here, the poster that's of the same kit. I mean, I've had that poster since I was 12 years old. I mean, I bought the thing. Yeah. I thought the thing in probably in like 1984 or 1983. Yeah, and it sat on my That's bedroom awesome. wall for all through high school. And so, you know, I, I, I probably looked at this kit more than any other kit in the photos, although it's, yeah. you know, it may not be my favorite of his kits. It's just, it's an amazing kit. So, it's iconic. Well, well, tell us what we have here. And I know you, you might not know every size, but just kind of well, what are we, what I, are we, run us through what we have. This is where I, where I was telling you I kind of needed to write some stuff down because it's it's a monster. So it basically, yeah. you know, you have the same, the 28 by 26 and 24 inch bass drums. The uh, two bass drums on the outer side connected with the hoses are 14 by 24s. Um, the toms go from 8 by 8, 8 by 10, 8 by 12, 9 by 13. 10 by 14, 12 by 14, uh, 11 by 15, and 12 by 16, just in the toms. And then, of course, you have an 18, 16 by 18 floor, 16 by 20 floor. You have the same Tama Mastercraft Rosewood Snare. Then you have Tama two-inch, you know, the two eight-inch octobands out in the very front. And then you have Tim Bollies off the left of the kit, which you can kind of see all way off to the past the hi-hat and those are pointed out to the other way for edward so that you know he can get up there and and jam on the timbales so it and it could then of course it's a it's an array of you know pisties ranging you know alex always seemed to play 15 inch hats and then you have you know 18s 19 20 you know, you know uh 20 inch you know you have mediums in there it's just it's hard to know exactly which symbols he had and he used sure. you know it, it says he's using a 24 inch heavy ride at this point and then of course behind him he's got the 40 inch symphonic gong and i gotta throw out there that that china on his, above kind of his fist that he's yep. holding up yep i don't know if i'm missing some sort of a joint or another stand but that is the longest arm of a symbol stand that is like i mean judging by the length of his arm that's like a five foot long boom arm is, holding up a china, maybe six feet. Like, it is unbelievable. I actually talked about this in like when we were talking about the John Densmore uh, issue, and I told you about my Gretsch kit. And I have a picture of myself in high school. And one year, I can remember in the eighties, I asked my mom for like a symbol stand for Christmas, and and I guess that's what you buy in the eighties. And so my mom gave me this. <laughs> it was, I believe, mine was a Rogers, but it was like probably from the XP eight series or whatever, and it was yeah. huge. And of course, at yeah. those days, I was probably playing a 16-inch crash. So I've got this 
you know, simple stand that probably weighed about 50 pounds and it could probably <laughs> boom out about as far yeah. as that one. And I'm holding a 16 inch crash on it. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. It's just, I mean, that is ridiculous. Insane how long that is. It, it, it's yeah. crazy. So again, here's more pictures. You can see the gong is on fire. Banks in the gong. The you know here there's um anybody that that uh, is curious to see there's a um, couple of videos from our Oakland California eighty one show that got filmed and um you know there's always been long rumored that the whole show's out there but nothing's ever come about except these three videos so uh, there's Unchained so this is love and hear about it later and um at the end of the Unchained Alex you know gets up and or I think it's Unchained and he's bashing the gong and it lights on fire and it's just like you know. They had a backdrop that lit up like a city, so the whole mm -hmm. stage looked, you know, gargantuan. And um, the funny thing is, is when they got the end of this tour, I believe they did a. They, at this point, they were a headlining act, and they really didn't open for anyone. But when uh, the Stones ask you to open for them, you know, you don't say no to the Stones. You open no. for the Stones. So yeah, you can well imagine Alex on the stage opening for the Stones, playing this kit when Charlie Watts is playing. You know. 22, 12, 16 inch maple yeah. finished Gretsch kit. kit. And it's yeah. like, are you kidding me right now? Like, it's just, wow. It's insane. And so here's yeah. a couple of angles of it. And you can just see, just, you know, there's that China boomed up. It's just, it's huge. So can you explain a little of the bass drum setup? Because before I didn't really realize the connection of the tubes. How is this? So again, there's four bass drums. How are these things connected? They're just, they're literally connected by like a, a tube that is screwed to the outside of the other bass drum. And um, so, of course, Alex's thought or belief, and he, he claims that he could hear the difference. I mean, I'm not sure what, but he claims that by doing this, the other outer bass drum would resonate, giving it more tone. So, like, hmm. basically, so they're mic'd. They're I mean, mic'd, really. you know, so they're all mic'd, apparently. And so, it may look silly to some to see four bass drums, but apparently he claims that the resin vibrations, you know, were producing sound and, and getting, you know, tone out of those bass drums. And so by miking those bass drums, you would get extra, extra tone. And, it, and it's funny too, you can actually see in this picture, there's some octobands that look like they're uh, on the other side. So they're likely, you know, Michael Anthony might have been playing those. You get Eddie playing the Timbales and David Lee Roth would come up. And the other thing to note, because I actually saw this kit in person when it was stacked up at the uh, Guitar Center in LA back in like 1998, they vibro foamed the shells, I guess. They used this like vibro foaming, it almost looked like plastic Paris. I don't even know what you would call it. I wish I had a better description of it. I just remember seeing mm. it going, what the heck? Because it really, like, the kit looks great in these photos when you're looking at, like, you know, it's it's a cool-looking kit. But when I saw it up close and in person, it looked kind of sloppy. Like, I was just kind of like, like the insides look, look like somebody, it's almost like when they spray, spray foam insulation in a house. It's almost yeah. like somebody just went into the inside. And, and I guess the reason for them doing this was to add strengths to the shells, which just absolutely blows my mind that this could happen. But apparently, and I wish I had a picture of this, David Lee Roth used to jump up and stand on top of the bass drums. And yeah, sure. these are, you know, Vistalite in pattern I don't know what pattern, if it's F or what pattern it is, but but it's not even like it's a solid Vistalite shell. They're like glued together seams of a Vistalite. So the fact that David Lee Roth stood on them, it just amazes me that somewhere in the middle of the tour, the bass drums didn't collapse. But yeah. apparently they never did because they're still they're still here today. But that yeah. whatever they did to the inside of them was like basically gave them this added extra strength. So yeah, and it's cool that he's using the Vista lights that are in the color pattern that aren't just the clear or the blue or the amber because well, you don't see super often people using. I mean, Bonham had a set of black and white stripes. Yeah, they might have been twisted, but you don't see these. Super and often. this had to have been 1981. Would have been probably at the very very end of the run of Vista lights. Uh, yeah. They they stopped making them probably by 1982. I'm guessing. Um, they just and I think you know. It, Particularly when they started making these pattern Vista lights, it started getting cost prohibitive, and and they was just you know, and, and they were falling out of fashion. But but it's interesting to note that Alex used a Vista light set, and you know, and he's got that same Thomas snare drum, and and just like every other yep. picture, you can see he's practically sitting on the ground, and the hi hats are all the way up, and it's likely he's playing the same cowbell because that cowbell looks pretty beat up at this point. 
But the other thing to note that I find interesting, you know, when I'm looking at these photos, and there's another cool shot of him, you can see clearly in this picture of the gong, you can see the gas line going up and around the gong. Oh, yeah, um, sure. You know, so the, I don't know where that line ran to. If maybe they had a propane tank hidden under the stage or something like that, you could actually see, you know, obviously Alex would never be able to hit those octobands that are way off to the side behind the three toms. So that must have been, you know, Michael and Anthony must even be able to hit him or something. And so there's, there's, they still got playing ghost pedals. Another shot of him yeah. playing, you know, sit, you see how low the stool is. The stool's like all the way to the ground. Again, the hats are all the way yeah, up. He's got like baseball, baseball pants on and like, yeah, like fo football uh, pants like or something. And, yeah. Or he, football pants. They're yeah. like kind of like to your like knee kind of. Um, yeah. And he wore a, he wore a headband cause you know, they would, you know, sweat. And then of course here's the, uh, the gong on fire. That's a pretty cool shot. And uh, you see how uh, how entertaining that must have looked from a, you know, especially if you're a young kid and you're going to your first concert and, you know, the gong's on fire and it's like, wow. And then in this picture here, you can see how big the sticks are. I mean, those things are yeah. literally like baseball bats. So, you know, he's playing the Black Dog Heads, the Peisty 2002s, all that stuff. Uh, and the other thing to note, you know, it's funny, like when I look at these photos, like the photo I have, the one behind me in that poster, I remember I used to like, sometimes I would count the microphones. I remember looking at that picture so many years when I was a kid. And I mean, I think I, I think I at least the the number I think I ended up at, and you couldn't even see the whole kit in this picture was about 29, maybe somewhere around there on just the drums. And you think about this and it's like, and if Greg Emerson really wasn't a drummer, like somebody had to sound check this. And it's like, you think about, you know, going to a club and watching some clown, you know, five check a five piece kit, you know, kick drum, kick drum, you know, snare drum, you yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah. okay. You know, yeah. first time, you know, second time, third time, fourth time, yeah. fifth time, you know, bass drum, four. Tom, bass drum four, you know, like, oh my yeah, God, like crazy. insane, like how many microphones are on this thing and like how much work that must have been. And then of course, yeah. you know, you had to, you know, to balance it and mix it and then you had overheads and oh my God. It's a huge, I mean, I, this stuff, it's probably a whole nother conversation, but I mean, I'm sure this helped push forward all these things help push forward, like staging and the the industry in general and things yeah. get bigger and better and and of course you know like alex and eddie you know it's like their their big their big joke was always like more is but more is always better you know like they, yeah. they always had a saying where they said their dad would always say like uh you know if it's all like you need for a buck i'd like two bucks worth you know like you know, it's yeah, just it's like that's some, funny. It, that's funny. you know, they, yeah. they, they, that's some of the, the, the philosophy they had. And of course, Alex yeah. has said in interviews that some of these kids were so damn big. And he said, of course, you know, you know, damn well, somebody's waiting for you to hit, you know, the rototom all the way to your left. And so like, at some point you just had to reach over there for no apparent reason yeah. for, you know, to play <laughs> this wacko fill just because you knew somebody was looking for it. And so, yeah, um, exactly. So, you know, this, this was probably, if I were to guess this kit and the next kit are about the pinnacle about as far as the number of pieces and the size and the, you know, overall. So as we move, you know, here's an ad where he did an ad for Peisty, you know, playing this kit. And then you can see, um, actually you can see in this picture, you can clearly see the Timbales over to the, you know, the side there that Eddie would play. Yep. Um, yep. But then there's a picture of the kit where it's all, you know, dumped on the floor or whatever. You can kind of see how dingy inside the shells look. It, it's yeah. kind of slopped together. I mean, you're supposed to see them from a from an arena or whatever. Yeah, you, you know? can see them from an arena, but, you know, and then, you know, the dreaded picture of me back in the 90s standing in front of this kit. And so <laughs> that looks good. they had a, a nice uh, hair. Oh yeah, I had a you know long long hair going, and it was about 1998, I think, when I was out there. And uh, this was yep. at the Guitar Center in Hollywood, and of course they had this thing set up totally wrong. You know, all those toms you see over the bass drum probably were the ones that went over the floor toms. They had the real toms stacked in the floor, you know, but they have a super sensitive with it. You can see, and they got you know the bass drums, and they're just not facing the right way. I mean, they don't. They just throw those things around and they put them down, but it was still cool to see it. It's very cool. And, uh, and you can see one of Michael's basses and Al and Eddie's guitar back there. But I mean, this guitar center was probably, you know, 20 minutes from their homes or whatever. And it's been rumored that, you know, I guess Alex had a warehouse where he kept all of his kits that were not being used. And so uh, hmm. previous kits would be stored in this warehouse. And so, yeah. So, you know, we, again, we finish up 1981 and, and it's really kind of funny because, um, 
they move on to the year 1982 and their plan, their manager had a plan that he, you know, the band was just getting burnt because they would go from album tour, album tour. And the plan for them for this time around was going to be like, okay, you guys have earned it. We're going to take some time off. And that way you guys can concentrate and record your next album. Well, of course, David Lee Roth, the ever, you know, was ever, you know, restless person decided that it was, um, you know, maybe we should put a single out just so that people know that we're still around. We're not going anywhere and we'll be back. And so they decided yeah. to record that cover of pretty woman. Well, when they recorded the fair warning album, they really didn't have, you know, it was probably, even though it's probably like every Van Halen's cult favorite Van Halen album at the time when they released it, it didn't really have any radio friendly hits. It was the lowest selling album in Van Halen's catalog. It was, you know, they had a rough time getting sales out of it. Even though, you know, as I said, now everybody, you know, it's everybody's favorite Van Halen album. But when uh, they released Pretty Woman, they instantly had like a top 40 hit. And so, of course, Warner Brothers went, well, where's the album? And they were like, well, no, wait, you know, we're not, but we're, we, we don't have time, we're time off. We're like, no, no, yeah. you guys have a hit single. We need that album. So they turned around, went back into the studio, banged out another album. But this time the album was done uh, in a very short time. And it was like half cover songs. And so, um. This is the period where Eddie got really frustrated because uh, he felt that he would rather bomb making his own music than doing a bunch of cover songs. And I yeah. think, you know, Dave and Ted Templeman were of the, you know, the, the philosophy that if you have a proven hit, you're already halfway there. And and the, only, the one cool thing that came from the album, I mean, there's some great originals on there, like Little Guitars is a great song and uh, mm -hmm. Secrets and... And there's some other cool stuff on there, the flamenco stuff that Eddie does for little guitars in the beginning. But um, but one of the cool things they did on there is that David Lee Roth had heard, he had a transistor radio and he heard, um, I picked up a radio station that was playing old jazz tunes. And so he heard this old song called Big Bad Bill. And so they worked up this tune as a jazz number and they actually had, you know, Jan Van Halen, who was, you know, the father, of course, come in and play clarinet on it. And the guy hadn't, you know, played in a long time. He was old and retired and and he was nervous. And they they had him play this clarinet part that was just perfect. You can totally tell listening to him play, you know, where the Van Halen feel comes from. But it's neat yeah. because, you know, Michael Anthony's playing one of those big, you know, up Mexican basses that you see in the restaurants. Eddie was That's playing cool. uh, jazz guitar and he's just like strumming, you know, eight note chords. But Alex is playing brushes and he plays you know basically just a kick drum a hi-hat and a snare drum and he's you know swinging right along just like any great <laughs> jazz drummer and it really shows yeah. that he had a you know people talk about his ability to swing and play and he certainly had that feel he could have probably stepped back into the 30s 40s big band era sure. and fit right in with all those guys so just a, a good drummer a very good drummer and, and of course the thing that that really i liked about it and loved about it to this day because it's one of my guilty pleasure tunes is and I just love hearing them jam that tune is my drum teacher was teaching me brushes and stuff when I was young. But of course, you know, when you hear it from, I don't know, it just didn't seem quite as cool until I heard that on a, on a Van Halen record. Yeah. I went, wait a minute. My drum teacher yeah. is cool. Like, wait a minute. These things yeah. are cool. Brushes are good. Yeah. Are, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's really dumb thinking, looking but back on it, think. but it's, you yeah. know, when you're 13 years old, that's, you know, and of course that's the, also the same year I saw Buddy Rich. So, so all of that started to, okay, you know, okay, this is pretty cool. So, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. so anyway, yeah. so we move on from the album. They went straight back out on tour again without a break, without any rest. But the next kit that Alex had was just as big as the fair warning tour kit. Just gargantuan, huge. Look at this thing. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, uh, he started off the tour with the, uh, the two toms mounted way up top. But he got rid of them not long after the tour started, and it would be my guess that he probably, because he had them like that on the Fair Warning tour, but maybe he got sick of not being able to see Eddie, um, I'm guessing. It's really kind of funny, and I've never heard anyone confirm this, but it's just a haunt or a guess of mine. But when um, when you hear them ending songs live a lot of times, you'll hear them come down on a crash. And then you'll hear the last crash that they do. Alex will do a precursor kick to that crash. It'll be like, a, you know, it'll be like, Dude. yeah, yeah, exactly. And so yeah. it is my belief personally, it's my bet, my get best guess and belief that some of Alex's sets were so big that he just could not physically see where Eddie or anybody was. And basically the end of the song fell on Alex. And so basically you hear that first kick, that second kick is coming right after it. And that's where you end yeah. it. And it would be my yeah. guess that they came up with this way because Alex probably was like, you know what? You guys are doing, 
you know, split kicks and running around the stage, and I'm behind this behemoth of a drum set. I can't see anybody, so this is how it's going to go. That's the cue. That's and, the equivalent of Gene Krupa doing his little cowbell to get out of a solo it, kind of thing. Exactly. Like, this is going to be <laughs> And, and it, again, yeah. it's never been confirmed. You know, I'd love to ask Alex that. It, knowing those guys, they were so intrinsic musically as a band, and I don't mean all of them, including Michael Anthony. I mean, they just, they were all so intrinsic. It, it wouldn't surprise me if it was nothing they even said. Uh, Alex probably did it yeah. one time, and they all went, okay, we got it. This set, though, is is incredible. I mean, it, so explain this a little bit. We're looking at like two bass drums that have, I think I counted maybe 17 or 18 smaller tubes coming out of it, so which is kind of a visual thing. The thought process for Alex was at the time, and again, you know, these are just wild ideas that he came up with, <clears> that he was thinking along the lines of a church organ. And so I think his original thought was that like, okay, you know, I wonder what it would be like if I had different tubes like a church organ, and depending on the room... Uh, I can mic different sections of the tubes and get different sounds. Uh, and it's a little crazy. Sounds. It's a little out there, but it's, uh, but it's, you know, it's, <laughs> why not why try, not try it? it? And then of course you can see he's got flanking bass drums again that are radial horn, you know, into the, you know, on the outside, which were mic and all that. And you can clearly see the timbalings in this picture. And uh, so the kit, if I were to run it down again, you have a 20, you know, 28 by 26, 28 by 24, but then you have um, two 16 by 20s, like uh, on either, you know, one on either side of the kit. So that's a little different having a 16 by 20 uh, back there because yeah. I think the previous kit had 24s on it. But then, you know, you have the same, uh, the tom sizes, you go from 8 by 8, 8 by 10, which are those little toms. And then you have the 8 by 12, 9 by 13, 10 by 14. And you can see they're using the modular mounts, you know, those big triangular mounts on the toms. Uh, the insides are painted white again. Uh, and then you could, the floor toms again were uh, 16 by 18 and then 18 by a uh, 16 by or 18 by 20. And then you have uh, the Tom of Mastercraft snare drum, you know, a couple of Pearl Very Pitch toms, which we'll see, and then the Timbales. And then the addition in this kit, which was brand new for him, was the addition of the Simmons. So he started adding mm -hmm. like three Simmons pads the, with the SDS V brain. Those came out around 1981, and he started getting into those. You know, he got rid of the two small toms up top, which, again, probably gave him a better view of Eddie. You know, they got the Lion logo at the top. You know, he's yep. got the gong behind him, 40-inch gong, the China up there. Um, all these different things. Um, it's just awesome. It's, it's just, visually, it's, visually it's, incredible. It's, it's incredible. Uh, yeah. You can see, like, they got flames in front of the kit now, flames at the back. Yep. The whole thing is just, you know, they got these... I don't know if they're real, if there's wall of speakers back there. It's just, you know, it's an intense-looking... Big stage. Um, and so the Simmons looks like this. This is the brain of a Simmons SDSV, which, yeah. you know, we'll get into detail more later as he got more into the Simmons. And then, of course, he used the original SDSV pads, which look like this. Um, you know, and they got the chrome, the sort of a chrome thing around the edging, and they're they're black. I guess the way they made those pads, too, is they, uh, they're, they're plastic clear and they would paint the insides of them which i was unaware of so as you can see as we uh move along these pictures alex had you know the three simmons pads over on the over the floor toms and he really got into those i think his influence for roto toms and uh simmons kind of came from um uh, bill bruford kind of gave him that little bit of an influence and so though that's what a new addition to the kit and so that pretty much takes care of the, the 1982 set that he used. And so what happened was, is again, the plan for them finally was to get off the road and take a long, well-deserved break so they can concentrate and make their next album. But what ended up happening was um, they did, they played a, a series of shows in South America at the end of the tour. And after the tour was over, they went back to the States. Well, um, all the gear was, you know, very slow in getting back to the States. And it was like, I don't think they really thought much about it because they didn't need it. David Lee Roth was on one of his jungle stud, you know, trips out in the Amazon. Well, around May of 1983, this computer uh, genius guy, Steve Wozniak, came up, you know, with, he had this US Festival that he did, and he offered you know, the opening headlining slot to Van Halen on, on Metal Day, and basically they were offered you know, offered the slot and initially they turned it down because they were like, you know, we're, we're taking a break. We're, we're fried. We're taking a break. And when they found out how much the payday was, which I guess they had a clause, which, you know, they ended up being the highest paid act 
and the entire thing. So they got something like one point five million dollars or something for one show or something. You know, wow. and for nineteen eighty three it was it made the Guinness Book of World Records and and all this stuff. And so of course when it came to the stage show, all the gear was, you know, being Eddie had basically said even though they made one point five million dollars, they spent just as much on the stage show because no, they didn't have anything. They had to have a whole new stage built and they yeah. just for this one show. So Alex got a, another kit. And so this is the kit, which is, you know, the only time he ever used it was at this show. So it's a, um, it's a three bass drum kit. There's actually only three bass drums. It, I, don't, I don't know why. Um, the, the only elongated, you know, I mean, the only bass drum attached, you know, on the edge is the one far left. And then you can see he's actually using power toms, which is something new. All of his kits previously had like standard depth sizes, like eight by twelves, nine by thirteens. But he's using um at this point now, you know, he's still got the 26, 24 inch elongated bass drums, but he has um a 16 by 24 all the way to the left. But his tom sizes are now 10 by 12, 11 by 13, and 12 by 14 with the modular mounts. Then he has a 16 by 18 and an 18 by 20 floor tom. Um, the Thomas snare once again. He's got the Pearl Verity pitch toms. He's got Timbales off the. I believe he. I think he might have Timbales, but he has Simmons SDSV with three pads again. And if you watch the video, they use. Um, they put out for with the US Festival footage. He actually uses the Simmons pads almost like ad nauseum. Like he's playing them hmm. everywhere in lieu of the regular yeah. toms. Like I don't even think he uses the the floor toms hardly at all. He's mostly wow. playing. You know, he'll do a few fills and stuff on the main toms, but he's all yeah. being with three toms. He's playing a lot of the Simmons on there. And um, the other thing that's really bizarre is I believe this photo, which is one they used in the uh, cover story for Modern Drummer for 1983, um, which was my first, you know, uh, one of my first issues of Modern Drummer was with him on the cover there. But this, they use these pictures, and you can see he's got white logo bass drum heads on there and the radial radial horns, which are kind of new. But, um, but for some reason, when they did the show, because uh, I believe that picture at first was sound check. Um, if you notice the show pictures, not only are the heads clear now, but the um, the bass drum hoops are red instead of white. It's really bizarre. Yeah, like, really. like I don't like know why. I don't. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why somebody did that. And, and and it's not like these are different shows. Like he only uses kit once to this one show, and that was it. Now the the horns, like, are those function? Is it They're, just a so cool looking thing? I or? think you know, and I'm not positive at this point yet because he eventually gets to the point where he's triggering Simmons bass drums from the kick drums. And so okay. I don't know if he had done it on this kit or not. And I don't know if the radial horns had the sounds coming out from there or if they were just for looks or, I mean, I guess he claims that they were, you know, everything had a, had a, a purpose with it, especially in including the long gated bass drum and the, the side bass yeah. drum. And it's just yeah. one of those things. But, um, yeah. But, but again, to explain for people just listening, this is literally like old horns from like the top of an old giant PA yeah, system, I believe, like the radio horn. And I believe they were all tech Lansing, you know, is what okay. they were. And so later on yeah. the kit, it's weird. This kit, Alex, once again, I think he may have either auctioned it off or given it, you know, a charity or something, but it got stolen at some point and it showed up. It was just for some reason, it showed up in some weird, like sketchy eBay ad. And this is like a picture of it basically from this weird ad, like the other bass weird. drum is gone and these are the only parts of it. And you can see like, even the, the, the drums look faded, like the, it's almost like the, um, the pictures of the, uh, you know, they've. The lips pictures got faded out in different various well, places. Yeah, I mean, and again, to explain for people just listening, it's it's got um, like lips and a mouth all over, like a collage all over it. So it's kind of a hard kit to like, you know. It's, it's pretty unique, and it's uh, you pretty know, unique, pretty unique for sure. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, the day of the show, he was wearing the the lips, you know, the t shirt. So here he is again with Greg Emerson, his tech, and uh, wearing the t shirt. And it's it is you know it's interesting, but it's a one off show, and so. In the interim, while they did this show, uh, Eddie had gotten, um, probably got an idea from Frank Zappa. He had visited Frank Zappa's home at one point and sort of befriended, you know, Frank. And, and that's where he got to know Dweezil Zappa. And uh, Frank had his own recording studio. And I want to say it was something like the research, like he called it something weird, like the research muffin facility kitchen or something like something <laughs> weird like that. It's only something yeah. Frank could come up with. But nonetheless, yeah. it, spa it sparked Eddie. 
got him real interested in, in, in having a studio of his own. And I think originally, you know, nobody really thought of it much more than Eddie just having like a couple of four tracks and he could go in there and lay down ideas or whatever. But I think this is where Eddie the scene really started to build where he thought, you know, I, I really, I think I can have a real studio. And so, yeah. uh, this is where 5150 was born in around 1983 and it was built out of a racquetball court that was on the back property of Edward's home up in the cold water Canyon. And so it originally started off as a pretty small area. And so when they decided to record 50, uh, 1984 there, uh, Don Landy was the engineer on it, but I guess Ted Templeman wasn't all that happy about them recording there where, you know, he was a record producer and he was like, you know, you, you go to a studio like sunset sound recorders, like you don't record albums. And, and this was back in the eighties. Like it's pretty commonplace now. Like, you know, Kenny yeah. Aronoff has a studio and a, you know, in a, in a, probably a storage unit that he rents out, you know, yeah. that, you know, but no, not then it'd be like, you want to do it in a racquetball you court? You want to do it in a, you know, <laughs> so they had this old racquetball court, they converted over and then Don Landy, the engineer who had done all those albums with Ted Templeman and, and all the Doobie brothers and little feet and Ted, I guess, uh, Don Landy was a, just a really smart guy and he could fix and wire anything up. So they had this old API board and they wired it up and, and, uh, he did all the wiring to it. So, so basically the story is the, the long story is they, um, when they recorded the 1984 album, Alex recorded it with mostly a hybrid kit of Simmons, Roto Toms and the, um, the Tama Mastercraft snare drum. So, mm -hmm. um, so the story is, is that, you know, I, I, it's, it's odd because I've heard all these conflicting stories and I'm one of those people that's like, I can't just listen to an album or watch a movie. Like I like to, like, I like to know how it was made. I like to know how they Me did too. stuff. I'm really curious. And, you know, and there's been this debate for years about like, you know, did, uh, they back up a Lamborghini to the record at the beginning of Hot for Teacher? Did Alex play it? Is it a Harley Davidson? What is it? You know, and it's like yeah. there are conflicting stories because Ten Templeman is saying it's the Lamborghini, but it's well known that they used a Lamborghini to get the revving sound in Panama. So, I mean, you know, the, the Lamborghini has a different sound to it because it's a, an Italian sports car you know and it doesn't you know you know that's why people think it's a harley but mm -hmm. truth be told and, and this is my own personal opinion alex has never come out and said this i think he played the thing on a simmons sdsv i think he played it in one tank i think he it's all him i i personally think it's 100 percent him um mm -hmm. i've got some simmons drums myself that i bought you know, from his influence. And we'll get into that more in the next, next episode. But I have an SDS eight brain, which is basically, basically like the, you know, the baby sister to the SDSV, And it gets a lot of the similar sounds and you can literally tune the floor tom to sound like the kick drum. And so when you have, you know, kick drums going and the floor tom going, they sound like a, like, just like that intro, it sounds very similar. And then when you listen to any live recording of them on the tour, Alex will do the intro for like a couple of seconds, but actually when he goes into the solo at the end of Hot for Teacher, he's basically doing the intro as part of his solo. And it sounds just gotcha. like the record to me. So I have no doubt in my mind, and I actually heard this story somewhere that, that and this, this would probably not surprise me in the least, that Alex shotgunned six beers before he went in and recorded Hot for Teacher in literally probably like one take. And it's my just God. like wow. an absolute masterpiece of a drum track that Jeez. but the yeah it is the other thing that is odd that i find it, it's been said that they had when they recorded in there because he was using the simmons and everything was all close quarters they couldn't really use the real drums because everything would bleed into one another and so they had to like try to you know it was easier to get isolation by using the simmons and so there are a lot of overdubs on there and i can hear it in some songs like if you hear like um apparently when they did uh, i'll wait you know there's the reason Alex didn't hit the crash when he came off the toms is because it, the crashes were overdubbed and he forgot to put mm -hmm. a crash there and they liked the way it sounded without a crash. And, uh, and you can actually hear it in songs like drop dead legs where they overdub some symbols and all that. But then there are other songs like girl gone bad and hot for teacher and even jump where it sounds to me clearly like he played that set straight up with the symbols, everything right. Yeah. You know, so I don't really understand yeah. What, what the issue really was with it. And not only that, mm. and, and I'll get into this later, I've got a friend 
that I know that actually recorded at 5150 with a band in the late 80s. Mm. And he recorded in that room, same room before they added the drum room. And he was playing his acoustic Camco drums. And like they, they literally, you know, mic'd him up like any drum set would and recorded it. And sometimes, the, you know, the complaints from the, uh, you know, Eddie will complain and say, well, Alex had to play Simmons drums because we were limited in the studio. But I don't know. I mean, I, I think that it was a long time ago. It was ago a long and, time ago. I, yeah. I think he liked them. I think he wanted to use them. But, you know, some people find them to be dated. I think they were, I liked them. I enjoyed them. I thought that he got some great sounds out of them. So, yeah. they, so they, they took the better part of a year, recorded 1984. And this is where I'll get into the last kit and the, the Dave years. And then we can move on to like, you know, Sammy Hagar years for the next episode or something. So when they recorded, I got a couple of photos. Like you can see, actually see the studio. I'm not exactly sure what year this is, but you can see how small and cramped it is. There's trash everywhere, but you can see the kit. There's a red, you know, SDS five kit. You can see the black toms, see the roto toms. And then you can see the Oberheim OBXA keyboard right there, which is likely, you know, at Eddie was probably facing Alex when they recorded jump. It is rumored that the first thing they ever recorded in that studio was in the midnight hour that was never released. So Van Halen fans have, you know, for years have been clamoring over the fact that there might be a version of, you know, in the midnight hour by Wilson Pickett recorded by Van Halen, but it is yet to ever come out of the vault and it likely never will. But supposedly the next the the first thing they really, you know, recorded in there was jump. And it was basically mm. one night Eddie had the riff they'd gone back to about 1981 or so, recorded it on you know in the back of a bus or on a on a cheap keyboard, and so he basically um, you know queued up the sound. If you look at that keyboard, you can see that you had to little twist a bunch of knobs to get sounds, and he created the you know the famous yeah. jump sound, and and basically recorded it just him and Alex probably staring at each other one night. And then everything else was overdubbed, the guitars later, the bass later, the vocals. And a lot of people talk about Jump, and they they talk about how, you know, I can't, I'm sick of the song, or they went pop. or But when I listen to that song, it's just, the take between Eddie and Alex is so magical. You know, even yeah, though Eddie's awesome. on a keyboard, it's it's just a magic take. Alex is playing is so, so nice on that. He yeah. like, He's got a great swing feel. They do these like, you know, it's a pop tune, but yet they got these offbeat things going in the solo. It's got syncopated parts. I mean, it's it's great. It's a great yeah. song. I mean, I just I I I can never hear it enough times. It just you know, I know people get sick of it, but I, I love the thing. I just think yeah. that original take they did in the studio. They you know sometimes and you've probably done it when you're recording at home and you just somehow did something and you can't realize how to recreate it. And I think yeah, that exactly. I think they just got. They got the money right on that one. It was beautiful. Yeah. And so that's yeah. why I love hearing it. It's just magic in a bottle. So they, they recorded the album and they decided at this point, MTV had already been out for a couple of years. So they decided, it, you know, they had to step into the ring and they had to make an MTV video. And so that's when they came up with the jump video. They were going to release jump as the first single. And so in the October of 83, they um, rented out like a little studio and they went, um, they went in and they recorded the jump video. Now, originally, David Lee Roth had this idea where he wanted to have all these weird shots or shot around town, and he made these videographer guys go around and shoot the band at all these different locations and doing different things, and um, and basically, like he wanted them interspersed into the video. Well, the director of the video felt strongly that the video should just be a performance video, and so he mm. basically cut a version of the video without any of this extra crap in it, brought it to Eddie and Alex, and said, "Look." You know, I'm probably going to get fired for this, but this is what you guys need to put out. And Alex and Eddie agreed, and that's what happened, which, of course, you know, was, you know, not happy for David Rob Roth. But no. so this picture here is a shot of Alex in his warehouse, and it was taken from those video shoots. And you can see all these different drums. You can see silver sparkle drums from, the you know, the old kit. You can see black drums from the, from the uh, Diver Down tour. There's part of the lips kit. You know, different yeah. hoops, the white toms in front of them from the uh, 1980 kit. But the one that puzzles me is the Rosewood bass drum right to his left there, or his right, rather. Um, it just, I don't know what it was used for. It makes me wonder if he used it in, in the studio on, like, Fair Warning or something like that. But, he, you know, sure. you can see he's, like, sitting on one of the toms from the Fair Warning kit. Um, you know, so, and, and there's 
back behind him over his left shoulder. There's, you know, the numbered kit from Van Halen too. So it's pretty cool to see all these kits all piled up in the, you know, and then when you watch the little outtake video clips that are floating around on YouTube, they actually tried to film him like he's buried under all the drums and he stands up and all these drums roll off of him and he lights a cigarette <laughs> with a, with an, you know, fire extinguisher and, and, uh, awesome. but they didn't use any of that stuff for the jump video. So when they, you know, recorded the jump video, the video, you can see him playing this kit and he's got in the video, he's playing the super sensitive, but he's got the famous taped, you know, triangle tape scenario for the snare, which is something, you which, know, it's kind of a that's his thing. His thing. Yeah. And he's playing this kit that's surrounded by roto toms. And then he's got these um, bass drums that have um, the uh, beaters glued all to it. So like you could see in parts of, you know, the jump video, here's, you know, the kit, he's playing some rude crashes and stuff that are peisty lines. But, but, you know, and he's got the gong behind him, but this was like, you know, glitzy kit. This is one of my favorite kits of his because, you know, if you haven't figured out yet, you know, all the times you've talked to me, I like wacky, you know, modern finishes and glitzy things. And, and I, I just, you know, the mirrors look really cool. They got a nice glitz to them. So it's basically like a broken mirror kind of disco broken ball, mirror, looking. disco ball looking thing. And apparently yeah. Alex gl hand glued all the mirrors on and I'm going to guess he did it with, you know, his tech. Um, uh, Greg Emerson, probably you can see the bass drum on off to the sides are connected with the hose again, but this kit yep. is primarily made up of roto toms. The roto toms were only used in like the video shoot. You can see he's playing, you know, again, the super sensitive snare drum with the straight badge. The badge is perfectly straight. You can see that he's, um, got, you know, surrounded by Peisty symbols. China's on either side of him. Black dot heads on the floor tops, porn in the bass drum. You know, you can see that's a 2002 ride he's got going on there. When they move on to the tour, you can actually see there's some photos floating around early on in the tour where I think he set the kit up, but he rounded it out with Simmons pads. So the entire kit had like six Simmons pads around it. And you can see that like basically the, the basis for the kit was, you know, you know, everything else was just basically augment, but you have, you know, two bass drums that were the main part of the kit and six Simmons pads. So... What do you do with the front? Because I think it probably looked a little weird that way. So you can see, like, he started off like, okay, let's throw some octobands up there. Yeah, I don't know if I like that. But you can see as he progressed along, okay, let's put some black ones up there. So he put black octobands up there. And it was probably like, okay, that's getting there. It looks a little bit better. But, you know, maybe we should make them look like the kit. You know, so here's like another shot. You see the black toms. And they just look a little weird. Like, it looks kind of... Kind of strange. It just looks big four bass drums, but these tiny little, it just didn't look right. So eventually you end up with, voila. So they ended up, uh, you know, putting the mirror finish on all the, the and they added a, there's seven total um, octobands on there in various sizes cut to various lengths. And so they put them up there. And so, so it just made the kit look a lot more cool. And so, no, it looks incredible. And th there's there's a close up shot that's kind of a funny one where he's pouring a beer in his mouth. But the the moment they caught that angle, it looks like he um, is pouring the beer and it's going in his eye. Yeah, exactly. and it makes me want laugh too because the uh, SDSV brain was not far probably from his, you know, out of. No. And so I wondered if he got beer all over it, you know, and like, yeah, probably, you know, and those things are probably not meant to have beer spilled into them. So there's, you no. know, you can see. Um, it just it looked cool under the lights because the mirrors reflected, and they would also there was also an ad they put out. I thought this is something I always kind of found funny is I have you know and you kind of see it behind me over to my, I guess over that way. Yes. I have this ad and framed. I've had it since the eighties, but it says you know here Alex Van Halen and his Ludwig's on Van Halen's latest. Well, if you listen to eighty four, I don't actually think there's a Ludwig on that album. All the sim, all the, the bass drums are Simmons. The wow. the toms okay. are Roto toms. The snare drums are Tama. So there really isn't a Ludwig on. There isn't a Ludwig on that. Album. They're claiming it though. <laughs> well, it, it is just funny to see that you're here, Alex on his Ludwigs. Well, and even the tour kit. There isn't a Ludwig in the tour kit. I mean, the 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 shells are Ludwig with Ludwig hardware, but they're being triggered. They had plywood sheets in there, which would you know trigger the Simmons kicks were in there. And so the Jeez, bass drums were a, Simmons, the toms were Simmons, and the, yeah, the snare was a Thomas. Times. It was just kind of just kind of funny to see that. I mean, the kit was just really cool looking. Um, and it and of course the stage setup was just gargantuan. It's almost like it's almost kind of like you know the the guys in the band knew that they were going to be you know this was the last time they were going to 
go out with Dave or whatever. I don't know if they knew it tr- instinctively, but they went out with a bang. And and it's funny yeah. because uh, we will touch on this, of course, in the next episode. But I wanted to see this tour like you. I mean, I was already a huge fan. And um, when this tour came around, I was 13 and it came to the Worcester Centrum. And of course, I live in New Hampshire and it's a good, good you know, hour, 45 minutes away. And I can remember begging my parents. And it's funny because my mom, who knows really nothing about concerts, I can remember her saying, um, you know, you know, it's a, it, it, you know, you're 13 years old. Maybe, you know, I don't know how concerts work. The next time they come around, maybe you'll be, uh, you'll, you'll be older. And it's like, you can have a license and you can drive yourself. And, and, and sure enough, you know, that came true. I, I saw them on the next tour, but no Dave. And so yeah, I never got, and different. all the years I've been a Van Halen fan, I have never seen Van Halen with all four original members. That just blows wow. my mind. So I could remember laying in my bed thinking, geez, they must be hitting the stage, you know, like, like it was <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. Uh, you know, oh, man. March of 1984. Wow. I was just like, I should have been there, but it, it just wasn't in the cards. Yeah, it just, 13's a little, 13's, 13's a, just all, your mom, well, now that I have kids, I'm like, your, your mom was probably right. It probably, but, um, and when you consider that the, the whole concert was, you know, pretty raucous and pretty, pretty wild. Yeah. But still nonetheless, yeah. and in the eighties, I mean, 13 year olds got away with a lot more than 13 year olds probably get away with now. No, definitely. But, um, but, you would have, you would have seen some, some bare chested ladies as, as a 13 oh, yeah. year old boy there. Yeah. I'm sure. And uh, I mean, just how cool does Alex look? He's got camel pants on and sunglasses. And you know, when you're a 13 year old, I mean, it's just like, Oh my God, like, you know, again, this is, yeah. this is my guy. And, uh, and behind this just ridiculous set of drums, which is so cool. And then, of course, there's a shot where you can see the toms have the, you know, the mirrors up close. And they're probably, you know, sloppily probably glued on there. I'm sure it wasn't anything, but it looked great from the stage. and, and yeah, uh, which is all that matters, really. Yeah. And so the other thing that was really cool, and this is the last thing I'll touch on because we're getting near the end of this, is um, sure. what happened was, is they, um, as the tour progressed, they they really only toured till about, like, july i want to say of 84 and then they took up like a, like a month or so off and then they did five shows to end out the tour and they played the monsters of rock starting in um england they they played with acdc as the headliner and it was like um i want to say uh motley crew was there and all these other bands that were um you know played i think ozzy osbourne was on that bill or something and so they played the monsters of rock and they played just as the sun was going down uh in castle donnington england and the thing that was really cool is that um uh all these years like i've heard a bootleg audio recording of this forever and there's been a video of like the hot for teacher basically but uh, a video just came out and it's pretty much gone now you know, I had to like sort of capture it when it was out but it was literally um a pro shot video that somebody filmed from the stage and it was clearly sanctioned by the band because the band's, you know, mm. making faces in the, you know, in the camera and the, you know, the, yeah. the guy was literally like a fifth member of the stage. And, um, wow. and, and to see this video just blew my mind because I saw angles of the kit and stuff that I'd never seen before. So mm. you can see in this, you know, the, you can always tell, this is like one of those shots because the backdrop of the stage is different. They weren't able to, yeah. they were outdoors, number one, and it was like dusk and they weren't, they weren't able to use, you know, the full walk around. Like there's actually a part of the video where David the Roth, you can see him like trying to get up on the catwalk to go around the back of the gong. And he's like, wait a minute, where the hell's the catwalk? You know, like there's no catwalk. So <laughs> yeah, we're like, can't get up, can't there. get up there. <laughs> and so he's like, okay, forget that. And the other thing that just blows my mind is just like, this was probably, one of the first of five shows and that last show they did in Nuremberg, Germany was the last show they ever did as the original Van Halen with Michael Anthony and Dave Lee Roth in the band. And, and, wow. and yeah. so here we are five days out and, and at this point, without getting into too much, there, there were obviously tensions within the band. It was not, you know, there was some, the, the band wasn't firing on all the right cylinders, but man, those guys still knew how to put on the show. It was unbelievable. Whatever problems they had off the stage, whatever issues they may have had, you know, personally, or even with, you know, substances, whatever they could just put on the show. And there's a, there's a perfect part. Like you, when you're watching, like running with the devil, you'll see Michael Anthony all of a sudden, like he just at the very beginning of the song, he backs up without like missing a cue and he sort of crouches over as David Lee Roth does like a handstand flip over his back. And if you blink your eyes, you probably would miss it, but you have to think it to yourself. There are 20 ways that thing could have gone wrong. 
There are, yeah. you know, David Lee Roth They're was totally insane. So David Lee Roth was probably half in the bag to begin with. And the fact that he did a handstand flip, it went literally off the back of Michael Anthony, pops up over the other side. And then this guy's just like, it was just like not even missing a beat. Like I've done stuff yeah. where I play gigs and I, you know, I'll throw the stick in the air like Neil Peart and catch it. Yeah. And, you know, in, in, I'd say, you know, nine times out of 10, it, you know, drops on the floor. I mean, like there are just <laughs> so many ways yeah. that trick could have gone sideways. And here they are just like, do do do. It's just, you know, another night, another yeah. night, you know? And so those guys really had the act down. They had that yeah. thing to a, They're meant to be yeah. it, unbelievable how tight that band was when they wanted to be and just like right on the money. So here's a really cool shot that I screen captured from that video. And you can see how crystal clear the video is. They actually oh, wow. biked the snare drum from the side. They actually, you know, it's this Thomas snare drum with the coffin lugs, and they actually have the mic on the side of the drum. I'd heard Alex talk about this, but I was like, what? But here's yeah, the actual, doesn't... like, the microphone. I mean, I've always mic'd a snare drum from the top, or, top. you know. And, and, and or, or bottom, the bottom. I have never and, seen and bottom. Yeah. anybody mic a snare drum from the side. Mm -hmm. That is just insane to me. And then yeah. here's another shot where... You know, he's, I mean, the video has got some really great shots in it and the camera guy was on stage and then here's a cool shot from where the guy was standing up over Alex to get a good, good view of things. And, uh, the other thing I thought was kind of funny, I saw this on a guitar form. You can't see this in my photos, but where Alex is, um, uh, he's playing the solo at the very end of hot for teacher. Well, um, in the video, you can see over to his left, uh, Greg Emerson creeps up over his side and does something to the hi hat. And I was watching this, um, interview on a you know some guys on a guitar show were talking about this and they were saying alex is so powerful he broke the hi-hat and you can see his tech in to fix it and i'm like you know of course i'm laughing going bunch of guitar players they don't know anything i mean because he was playing off a teacher where they had the hats partially closed so greg had to come in he wasn't using a hi-hat clutch so greg had to come in and he had to reopen the hi-hats again Greg would literally manually come in, lower the hats for him so that he could have them partially closed for half a teacher. But while Alex was off to the, you know, floor toms finishing up his solo, Greg would sneak in there and put the hats back up. But That's I just thought funny. it was funny because I, you know, as a drummer, I knew exactly what he was doing. But to see a bunch of guitar players, oh, he yeah. broke the hi hat. No, he didn't. They don't know what they're. They talking don't know what about. you're talking about. <laughs> I thought that yeah. was kind of humorous. That so, is funny. Some yeah. other, you know shots you can see the set list off to his left there it's still kind of yeah. daytime so that basically uh, you know they did these five shows and it's really kind of a sad way to end things but they ended up um doing the last show in nuremberg germany and went their separate ways went home and 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 that was it the band never really jeez you know the band you know well, they can they they carried on, but Sammy Hagar joined, but the, the kits became, you know, yeah. the kits stayed cool. So there's plenty more to there's talk plenty about. There's plenty more to talk about. And we can, we can end it here and, if you'd like. And yes, I think we should for the sake yes, of yeah, uh, I know it's time. been, it's been quite a long time. It's no, this is good. This is what people like. And they, they want out of these episodes is the deep, deep, deep dive. Yeah. So there's still lots to talk about. There's. So, um, we will end here though, for the sake of time in part one, yep. and then Kurt and I will record part two and we'll, we'll have that out soon after yep. this, um, the, the week after you guys watch this. Um, so Kurt, anything you want to plug as we kind of wrap up this episode and tell people where to find you or anything cool going on? I mean, on? it just, you know, it's just the same old, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm on Facebook, I'm on the usual places. I think in Instagram, although I don't use those, I don't use those as much as, you know, as most people would, I, I probably should be better yep. at that, but I guess I'm no. an old dude and I don't really, you know, you know, that's all right. But, WFL Kurt, you can find him around at WFL Kurt. Yep. And, uh, and again, and that's I, about it. So, I want to yeah. say thank you to Alex for being a big inspiration and, and, you know, and, and recognize his tech, John Douglas for putting a lot of work in the, um, of uh, the book that's called legends. You can pick it up from modern drummer and it's got a lot of cool info in it. Yeah, that's great this is a good primer and then people can go further. And if they want to learn more about his history and his biography and all that stuff, then I'm sure there's tons more info. Yeah. And Alex um, also, uh, Alex just got inducted into the modern drummer hall of fame. So I'd like to say congratulations oh, yeah, to that right. as well. So yeah, 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 yeah. Huge congrats to Alex Fanny. Yeah. I mean, it seems like such a cool guy. Yep. Um, so, okay. Well, thank you to everyone for listening and sticking with us and per usual drop comments about things that you like. And if you saw them live and what concert you saw and your favorite kit, favorite album, yep. uh, things we may have missed and things that, you know, you think, oh, I think it's this instead or his early symbols, um, yep. stuff like that. Yeah, so, if, people, um, if people know more about like specifics, you know, with the symbols and all that, feel free to, you know. It's just fun to 
yeah. get a conversation There's going. just so yeah. many pieces and parts to all of this. It's in, unbelievable. Kurt, thanks for being here, man. We'll get part two recorded, and I'm excited to learn more about uh, you know his later kits as well. But this is we've covered the iconic beginning of Alex Van Halen. Yes. So uh, thank you, Kurt. All right. Well, thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it.